This is Jocko Podcast number 145 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The primary mission of the Marine Rifle Company and Platoon is to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver or to repel his assault by fire and close combat. The primary mission of the weapons platoon of the rifle company is to provide supporting direct and indirect fires, including close in anti tank fires and demolitions for maneuvering or defending elements of the rifle company. Boom. <laughs> it does not get much more straightforward than that. That is taken directly from. FM FM six TAC four Marine Rifle Company, and this is a this is a solid manual, a very solid manual, a very solid field manual, mm. and one of the reasons that I pulled it out again because I wanted to look at the general principles of war, and this has so the the U.S. military all branches talk about the principles of war as the Amer- as America sees the principles of war. Mm. For whatever reason, the FM FM t- six tac four has sort of the best descriptions of them that I like. I should say maybe they're not the best. They're yeah. my preferential ones, the yeah. ones that I prefer. Yeah. So the principles of war, pretty straightforward. But I wanted to talk about them, and this kind of led me down a little rabbit hole, which I sometimes go into when it comes to you know military strategies, principles, tactics. Sure. And I ended up in a place that I that I thought was very interesting. It kind of brought me back to something that I'd uncovered years ago. One of those early things that started to gel my thought process sure. started to started to see little 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 connections in the world. Yeah. So it started with this. So the principles of war. So they, they talk about just these broad principles of war. Again, everyone in the military covers these principles. Everyone in the U.S. military covers these principles of war. Here's how the Marine Corps in the Marine Rifle Company manual discusses them. Okay, principles of war. General, the principles of war are fundamental truths governing the prosecution of war. <laughs> That's so legit. Anyways, I'm going to read that again. The principles of war are fundamental truths governing the prosecution of war. There you go. The principles of war are guidelines to be used by a commander to effectively apply the combat power of the Marine company or platoon to aid in the accomplishment of the assigned mission. The effective application of these principles is essential to the proper exercise of command and the conduct of war. Although combat leaders have studied the principles, it is not enough to name them in sequence, but rather to know when and how to relate them to the combat environment. The principles of war are included here to provide a review for the commander to be used when applying doctrine contained in this manual. Now, the important part to remember is, and you're going to see this, that these principles do not only apply to war at all. In fact, they apply to everything. Principle number one, objective. The objective of a military force is the goal or aim usually expressed as a mission for which the force was constituted. This principle is overriding. it It is applicable to any operation at any level of command. The objective of a force can be stated in either broad or precise terms depending upon the nature of the goal. Each element of an infantry unit contributes to the attainment of the objective of the larger unit of which it is a part. For example, when the objective of a battalion has been defined, all elements of the battalion must be assigned objectives that facilitate the attainment of the battalion objective. Success in combat is measured by the accomplishment of the mission. So this is important to remember from a leadership perspective. When you come up with a mission, and it's a broad mission, for your company or for your team, then the smaller teams within your team 
have got to redefine that mission as it applies to them and make sure that what they come up with for a mission is aligned with and supports the broader mission of the team. Mm -hmm. So when you own a manufacturing plant and your goal is to manufacture X amount of widgets a month, well then the people on the line, they have their little portion of that widget that they manufacture and they gotta make sure that they can fulfill their part of mission that allows you to do this overall success. Mm Also, there's like supply people that are bringing the supplies in for the widget. Their goal, their mission is to provide the supplies needed to make these things. And so that's what it is. You've got to make sure that the, the mission of the sub- subordinate units are in support of and nested inside of the broader mission. Mm. But sometimes we forget as leaders that the, fr- the frontline people or the subordinate people below you in the chain of command, they might not understand that they need to do that. Mm. Might not happen. Yeah. So you need to do it for them. Hmm. Sometimes you need to spell things out. Yeah. Next, offensive. By the offensive, the commander can impose his will on the enemy, set the pace and course of battle, exploit enemy weaknesses, and meet unexpected develop, developments. Boom, be on the offensive. Mm-hmm. What, what, do, what do we call this? We call this default aggressive, yeah. right? That's the, that's the similar, and I will continue to make the comparisons between what we talk about, what I, talk, what I came up with the original four laws of combat, mm-hmm. and how they are intertwined with these mm-hmm. principles. Back to the book. Even in the defensive, the commander must be alert to regain the initiative by offensive counteractions. Aggressiveness, flexibility of mind, and the ability to make rapid, reasoned decisions are required to apply fully the principle of the offensive. In defense, the commander can often best accomplish his mission by offensive action. So even when you're on defense, you should be you should be looking to go on the offense. Mm-hmm. And there's some other definitions that talk about and this is very, very clear when you're training jujitsu. Have you ever trained with someone? Well, I know you have. When you're training with someone that's constantly attacking, yes. that's that's you're gonna go down. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna when someone that's how someone gets the upper hand. They're attacking here, they're attacking there, they're attacking over here, they're attacking back there again. Mm-hmm. And you're constantly on the defense, 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 and eventually they get the upper hand and crush you. Yeah, very clear in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Next, simplicity. Simplicity demands that detailed, simple plans be adopted in every military operation. It's an interesting dichotomy, detailed Detailed. and simple. Mm. It is, of course, a relative term because all actions in war are essentially complex. That's a great point. And I talk about that too. I talk about how easy it is to, like how these, how a mission, hey, it's so easy to, a SEAL mission is not rocket science, right? Mm. It's not brain surgery. You know where the bad guy is. You know where you are. You're gonna load in some helicopters or some vehicles or some boats. You're gonna go to where they are and you're gonna get them and you're gonna come back. There's the mission. That's a little oversimplified. Yeah, yeah. And it's not that much oversimplified, but you know, there's things like fuel, there's things like load load plans, there's things about weight, how much each vehicle can carry or how much each helicopter can carry. So there's there are de- and how you're gonna put cover fire down. There's a, there are more detailed things. Mm-hmm. So like the statement says, all actions in war are essentially complex, and I will say that all actions in war are also essentially simple. Mm-hmm. Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to close with and destroy the enemy. That's it. Mm. I've had that happen with companies where I go into a company and they've lost sight of the simplicity of their mission. The simplicity of their mission is to make something. And they get all wrapped around all these other things. But what you're supposed to be doing is making this thing. And everything that you're doing should be lead to supporting the making of this thing. And people go down, they they focus their efforts in other areas. So it's good to think about Yes, there's complexities. It's a, it's a total dichotomy. Yeah. It's a total dichotomy in business too, right? There's a total dichotomy. It's, it's very complicated, but at the same time, it's actually very simple. Hmm. So when you feel things getting too complicated, that's when you take a step back and you go, okay, what, is we, what are we actually trying to do here? Yeah. That's the question. Mm-hmm. 
back to the book simplicity will be especially important on the nuclear battlefield where the full use of available means will require close control and coordination and where plans must be simple as simple as the situation will will permit detailed simple plans lead to coordinated timely execution so what's interesting the, the copy that I'm using of this and it's gonna lead to the rest of this whole podcast which which is when we're gonna start talking about the Soviets and which goes back to the 80s Hmm. I think the date on this book on this particular version is the 80s which is Cold War prepare for nuclear combat (laughs) that's Hmm. that and when we get into the Soviets and what they're thinking you're gonna see nuclear combat was absolutely part of it was part of their planning yeah and so same thing here I don't even know that I have a comment about keeping your nuclear war simple. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know if I have a comment on that. Mm. Hey, we're going to drop bombs and everyone is going to die. I don't know how we simplify that anymore. Yeah. And clearly, laws of combat, simplicity, simple. That's one of the primary laws. That's actually law number two in my laws of combat that we put in extreme ownership. And why is that? Because I would see over and over and over again what would jam up, to use your term, what would jam up a SEAL platoon is a complicated plan. Mm. They would do it every single time. So you have to keep it simple. And that's one of those ones, before I really started diving into sort of the broad canon of military theory, I I had told everyone, hey, you gotta keep it simple, you gotta keep it simple, and I had been told. You know, the Vietnam guys would say, keep it simple, stupid, you know, kiss. Mm. But I, I was a little nervous that I was maybe overboard with that. And, and as soon as you start looking at it, keeping things simple is a broad military principle that's been around forever. Mm. And there's a reason, because it's true. Next up, unity of command. Unity of command is the establishment of a single authority. This is the best means of ensuring unity of effort, which implies a singleness of purpose and cooperation by all elements of the command. That one seems obvious. I'll tell you what prevents this from happening. Most of the time, it's ego. Most of the time in the business world, it's no one wants to say, hey, you know what? We're putting this other guy in charge. Give him the support that he needs. Mm. Most of the time in the business world, well, you know, we don't want to make Billy feel bad. Oh yeah. yeah. So you know what? You run this part of it, and then you run the other part of it, and then and then Jennifer over here, she can run the. So it's all. It's actually all three of you going to coordinate together to uh, to make this happen. Mm. Well, who's in charge? You're all in charge. Yeah, yeah. How's that work out? Yeah. Not good. Yeah. The only way it works out good is if one of those people or or two of the three people are exquisite leaders with no egos Mm. and can prop up the other person that's an egomaniac and make them feel good and let it happen otherwise it's gonna be problematic Mm. you'd see this so in the military what they do is they designate someone as the main effort so one one company or one battalion will be designated okay you're the main effort we're all here to support you Yeah, yeah that's that's something you definitely have to be careful of And I'll tell you, I'll give you a little hint, a little help. The best way to do this is just to do it. The best way to do it is to be like, hey, you know what? I I need one person running this, so Billy, you got this one. Jennifer, I'll probably give you the next one, but Billy, you need to to take command of this one. I know you know this terrain a little bit better. You run this one. Jennifer, if we go over to your, your market area next time, you'll be running it. So... Do what you can to support Billy right now, because you, he'll be supporting you in the future. Yeah, yeah. Boom, done. Yeah. What we, what people do, they don't want to have the hard conversation. They don't want to just tell Jennifer that she needs to take the back seat on this one. That hurts too much, so they put everyone in charge, and now yeah. you got no one in charge, and now you got a disaster on your hand. Yeah. Unity of command. Yeah. Next, mass. Mass depends. Or sorry, mass demands that superiority of combat power be attained at the critical time and place for a decisive purpose. This superiority is both qualitative and quantitative. Combat power is primarily a combination of firepower and maneuver, 
which is applied at the right time at the right place for a decisive purpose so what does this mean focus your efforts yeah this means prioritize and execute this is the same thing this is the same idea as prioritize and execute mm-hmm. which is pick where pick what the biggest problem is and that's what you're going to attack focus your resources on it mm-hmm. back to the book the use of nuclear weapons by enemy forces will require greater dispersion for passive defense. Therefore, a greater stress must be placed on the application of mass from the point of view of time rather than space. Violation of this principle exposes the command to the risk of piecemeal defeat even by an inferior enemy. (sighs) Let's hope we don't have nuclear war. Next, economy of force. Economy, oh, before we get there, mass. I mean, another, another way that this relates to jiu-jitsu is that when you get an arm lock, what are you doing? You're focusing all your strength on yeah. the one weak point of the enemy. Yeah. When you get a choke, what are you doing? You're focusing all your force on that one weak point of the enemy, their neck. Yeah, yeah. And you're... Yep. Next, number six, economy of force. Economy of force requires that sufficient force be applied at other than the decisive time and place to permit mass to be applied at the point of decision. These two principles, economy of force and mass, are so closely related that they cannot be considered singly. Application of the two principles requires a sound estimate of what is sufficient elsewhere to permit the attainment of decisive superiority at the decisive time and place. Sufficient is the key. It connotes the application of force necessary to accomplish the purpose and not the application of as little force as possible. So economy of force, this is, we heard a lot about this in judo, mm-hmm. right? When we, when we talked about judo in depth, it's all about economy of force. That's yeah. sort of the underlying principle yeah. of judo, which therefore makes it one of the underlying principles of jujitsu. Depending on what kind of game you got, that's what I was gonna say. It's like, <laughs> right? I mean, that's cool in theory, but yeah. you know, get on the mats. It's it's not gonna be like that all the time. I mean, yeah, if you can perfect it, good. That's but how. there's some people that have the kind of game where they're going to use economy of force to their advantage because they're gonna wear the other person out. Yeah. I would say I actually do that. Yeah. I do that. I don't I will I will allow people to move around and get tired. Yeah. And that's sort of a yeah. good thing for me to do. I don't do it all the time and I can't do it to everyone. Yeah. You know, I can't so right now I can't really tire out Andy. Big <laughs> Andy. <laughs> well, he's you know. he's not getting tired right now. Yeah. And the, yeah. The um it, that's the general principle. You know, like it's just generally that's what you're doing. Whether you're perfecting it or not, generally that's what you do. So like, you know, when you're a white belt and someone mounts you, or even if you mount somebody, Mm -hmm. you're like going for stuff and you're trying to get out immediately and all this stuff, even though, bro, that's not the best time to get out. You can kind of use timing. Actually, I understand your point. Well, before they settle. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's There's that. The the best time to get out is right when they get there. Right, before they settle. And by the way, that's the best time. That's the best time to disrupt any situation. Yeah. Like if you've got a situation like a self-defense situation you yeah. you just disrupt it immediately as soon as it starts right yeah. you just poke some you know stick a pen in their eye and run away right yeah. you don't wait for them to grab you and ha- you, don't, you don't do that yeah. an active shooter situation you know you don't think oh well i'm gonna see where this is going no you immediately disrupt it get out of there as fast as you can yeah you so, don't wait around yeah so you don't let the enemy settle in their position right. because Fair. once they settle in their position they're they're now they can now focus on what's happening because wow. they're no longer having to focus on settling, yeah. right? They've, they've established position. When, you, when you're fighting against an established position, it's problematic. Yeah, well, and, and I guess you know, you know, maybe it's a little bit different, but technically it's in the transition, basically. It is in the so, transition. So it's like the Dean does a really good job of teaching where as the person gets 
into their final movement to get in position, yeah. he teaches where the gaps are because yes. there are definite gaps there. Yeah, and and in the middle of a trans- transition, for example, that's that's a huge gap. But in a way, since they don't necessarily have whatever the position they're going for, like the mount, for example, mm-hmm. in the transition to the mount, they don't really have the mount. Right. So that's a huge gap, but it's not technically you know, escaping the mount technically because they don't right, have right, it. So right. when you go to the other side of that, that transition still in the transition though, maybe the second, we'll call it the second half of the transition. Mm-hmm. It's be way before they settle for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. That's where it's going to be hundred percent. But yep. when you're a white belt though, let's say they, they settle in and you don't want someone gets like, okay, we're going to use a mount as the example. The guy's mounted, right? Hooks it or feet established, mm-hmm. hands, weight so established, he's full, fully mounted, fully mounted Got points it. established, mm-hmm. whatever, if you're in a tournament. Oh, uh, and the earlier, the earlier on the, in your jujitsu career, you're going to be trying to get out of there yeah, immediately. Yeah, getting and, nuts. Yeah, and that's not economy of, no. of force right there because it's the like the person is fully established. Yeah. In fact, I'll go ahead and tell you, there's you're you're wasting energy exactly because that right. person is fully established. Yeah, exactly. You right. lost your opportunity. Yeah. When during that transitional period. Right. So, so the point there though is. In jiu-jitsu, the more you learn, the more you kind of learn about jiu-jitsu, the more you re- you realize that, yeah, this, this that's a general purpose. Like, your whole jiu-jitsu game is economy of force. Right. Your whole game. You're not going to perfect it every single split second of the, your jiu-jitsu. No. Sometimes you'll even step outside of the rule to make something specific happen yeah, or sometimes whatever. sometimes Dean will be like, oh, that was a spaz defense. Right. Like, I'll just get nuts for a few seconds yeah. because... You know, in hopes that an opening opens up, and yeah. oftentimes it does. Or I'm you're stronger not, than that guy for a I second, am not or whatever. Condoning no. or encouraging the spaz yeah. as the premier escape situation because yeah. well, it's not. Because yeah. there's plenty of times, especially against an unskilled opponent, they can spaz all they want. They're not going anywhere. Yes, correct. Yeah, exactly right. And now then, I got something. You know, I talked to. Uh, I was talking to Dave Burke about this. Good deal, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> and. From a leadership perspective, there is also something very similar that happens from a leadership perspective. As a leader, let's say, okay, when you're a black belt or a brown belt, you have someone that's a white belt, right? And they're, you're mounted on them. And they're grabbing, whatever they're grabbing, mm-hmm. they're grabbing it with full like mm-hmm. craziness. They're grabbing your belt. Yeah. Or they're or they're grabbing your sleeve like as hard as they possibly can yeah. or they're grabbing your neck It is no factor, right? I mean, it's it's literally no factor to you mm-hmm. If you make it a factor that me just means you're not experienced enough That means yeah. if you're only a if you're only a, a blue belt and You're going against a lower blue belt and you might start getting concerned about this, mm-hmm. but when you're a black belt You're like, oh, this doesn't matter right. from a leadership perspective There's things that are going on with your team, with individuals on your team. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're concerned about them. And they freak you out and they make you react. Mm. And yet, if you're a black belt, these things happen and you just you just realize what they are. Mm. It's just wasted energy right. for them and it's gonna have no pa- impact on the long-term deal that you're, you know where you're going. Yeah. So. It's a it's a clear indicator to me when I'm working with a leader and they're spun up about little things. Yeah. I for some reason I always think of like they're spun up that the person's grabbing their their belt. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. You're mounted on them and they're grabbing your belt like they're gonna do something with it. They can't do yeah. anything. That happens all the time from a leadership perspective. Mm-hmm. Someone, you know, some of your subordinates are doing something crazy. It's like, okay, does it really matter? Most of the time it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Occasionally you gotta address it. Like if a guy if a guy's if you're mounted on a guy and he starts to lift your knee, you reach down and address it. Yeah. No big deal. You don't panic. You don't give up the mount. Yeah. You just address it and then you you take it back to normal. Yeah. So as a le- and what this has to do with really is has to do with detachment because y- you if you're detached, you'll see that whatever this situation is is not that big of a deal. Yeah. But when you're all up in the fight and they're grabbing your belt, they're grabbing your sleeve, and you're freaking out, yeah. you're not doing a good job of detachment at all. Yeah. Feels like right. they're up to something. I don't know what it is, yep. but you know, just I don't feel right about it. I see it all the time. And by the way, it, here's another important piece: if they're doing something, if they're grabbing your sleeve, and now you expend energy to stop that, well, you're expending energy. You're not following the idea of economy of force. Yeah. And what you're also doing is you're giving up leadership capital because you're wasting time trying to stop them from doing something that yeah. doesn't even matter. Yeah. So why are you worried about that? 
Let that thing go. Focus. Just let that thing go. Focus on the wrong things. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In when when I was a bouncer, they this was part of the training, but they did call it minim, min, the minimum minimum use of force. force. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which kind of when you're training, it kind of it's kind of like especially if you've been in like breaking up a like a significant fight situation, you start telling me that I got to use minimum. Yeah. I'm like, it just sounds off. I know what they mean, and this is what they mean right here. S- sufficient. They mean sufficient. Yeah. They basically they don't want you well, overdoing it. And, yeah. And they do mean. Else. They do mean minimum but they yeah. also mean sufficient yeah because minimum it, it, well if you use the minimum force required and it works then it was sufficient right, right? yeah <laughs> yeah and I, and I understood it when they said it of course like it's a when when we're not in the situation it's yeah, like yeah. yeah that's true technically that's yes, true we'll use minimum but force. it just sound I like how they use sufficient though because it when when you hear like especially if you're talking about warfare or in my case, bouncing when you're breaking up guys fighting with you know bottles or whatever, and they're saying, "Hey, use the minimum." You're like, "Bro, I, no, man, we're going in there. We get it done as quick as we can." Yeah. But the thing is, it's like, "No, bro." Like, but you're you not going to use maximum. Yeah, you're right? not going in there swinging punches. No. You're breaking it up, you know, right. kind of thing. And it makes sense because guys will do that. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, it's fight time," you know, kind of thing. And then they'll like injure somebody or something like that when they don't have to. Yeah, not good. And then sufficient. Could, sufficient. Sufficient force check. All right. Next. <clears throat> Maneuver. Maneuver requires that all military resources be brought to bear in the accomplishment of the objective. Correct application of the principle of maneuver requires not only the full use of combat power at the decisive time and place, but includes the movements of elements of combat power, including combat service support, to the area of operations. That's pretty straightforward. You yeah. you have to move your people into the right positions, including the support people that need to get there to keep the logistics lines open, to keep the intelligence flowing, to keep the radios working and all that. Mm-hmm. Application of this principle is a function of command at all levels. At the highest level, it usually means the movement of men, means, and supplies to an area of operations, and at the lowest level, it means the positioning of troop units and fires to destroy the enemy. Straightforward. That's what that one is. Mm. Next. Surprise. Surprised connotes striking the enemy when, where, or in such a manner that he is unable to counter effectively. The achievement of surprise is not necessarily dependent upon misleading the enemy as to intentions, such as, for example, concealing from him an intention of attacking. He may know from the situation that he will be attacked, yet, The attacker may achieve surprise by the time, place, direction, size, or composition of forces or tactics employed. Yeah, that one's pretty straightforward. That one's pretty straightforward. That's That's the difference. Really, that's the difference. That's one of the differences between like a white belt and a blue belt. I mean, it's actually, it's, it's not even to blue belt yet. You got to be able to surprise the person. Yeah. They, they can't know what's coming in jujitsu. If they know what's coming, and they know any jujitsu, they're going to defend that thing. Yeah. So surprise comes when you are baiting them with one thing and you hit them with something else. And when yeah. you first, I've told that I told you that story. Like when the first, the, when I was like a white belt, I'd probably been training for like four weeks. Yeah. yeah. And this seal buddy of mine who had been training for a while, but kind of off and on, and and. He was a friend of mine, and as soon as I was training for like a week, I was like, hey, let's train. Yeah, yeah, you're and so, ready. So I was kind of roughing him up, right? Because yeah, yeah. he, he was training off and on, and but he's a good dude, a great dude. And I said to him, so after like three weeks, I said to him, you know, here's the thing. In jiu-jitsu, you can't just do one move. you got to like set it up with something else. Yeah. And the next time we rolled, he was going for a choke hard on me. And I was like, dude, this guy's, oh man, I don't want to tap to this guy. I can't mm. let him. Boom, he unlocked me. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. Defend the choke. Yeah, and I, that was the last time that happened. <laughs> but you, you didn't like it, that. What huh? was awesome was he took just, he took just my words yeah. of what I told him. And this, this guy's a freaking awesome seal. He took just my words of what I told him and applied him to what he already knew physically about how to do a choke and how to do an arm lock. Yeah. And he arm locked me. Yeah. 
Yeah, surprise. Surprise. Yeah, that's how jujitsu is. Surprise, surprise. There you go. That's how jujitsu is just kind of naturally, too, because they're like, since they're grappling movements, like, unless you're one of these super duper quick guys, you know, mm-hmm. like everything's going to be more or less telegraphed, you know? If, like, if I say, <laughs> hey, Jocko, um, if I know you love the arm lock and you, you know, just go for arm locks, but I'm going to know that's coming. Yes and no. I, I agree with you. There's sometimes when I submit people, when they completely know that it's coming and they can't stop it. Dean does that to me. Yeah. Where it's like, he's getting an arm lock and I can't stop him. He could say like, here it comes. And I'm like, oh, I know it's coming. I can feel it coming. I can feel, and and I can't stop it. Yeah, but here's the thing about that technique too. That's like, well, there's two elements that go on in here. One, there's like, okay, Dean, because we talked about this before. Uh, Well, Dean, like, he's gonna say, okay, Dean, I'm gonna- The thing that the, the surprise came earlier. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, and so he got point. into a position where not either he was ahead of you now or he's in a position where all your defenses that he knows have to come for for you to stop him. Yeah. He knows the defense and all that. He put himself early on into a position where he can shut down those defenses which, before which, you need him. To the point of this, he did through surprise. through surprise. He did some little movement and yeah. all of a sudden he's mounted with my arm exposed. Yes. And now or I know I'm going to get arm locked. Yeah. I can't can't get out of it. Exactly right. So But Sometimes so but so so sometimes you do submit people like that where they know it's coming But you're right. You got to get that surprise movement to get in position in position and they're also the second part is uh, Mike like little uh, for lack of a better term micro surprises So it's like (laughs) you know, it's like hey I'm gonna go for this arm lock and I know your arm lock is coming But just even for like a half a second split second. I'm gonna like tip you off balance yep. just for that split second you're like oh your mind goes okay or you're just your body just even reaction. if your mind is still on the arm lock you're like <clears throat> your reaction oh i gotta put my you know you know that it's like our early move you learn and um akbar used to do this all the time where mm. you know the sit-up sweep from the yeah. guard sit-up sweep yeah. for the guard and when you base you go tra- you go back to the triangle yeah that's what you do because to, to base you put your arm down right. you can right. get your leg over like that for example like if someone likes to do triangle, Joel Tudor used to do that stuff to me all the time because he liked the triangle. And with the yeah, triangle. he'd do these little things that you got to put your arm down just real quick. Even if you're like, yeah, just real quick, I'll just put it down real quick to base or whatever, and I'll put it right back into the defensive position. You're like, bro, that's a little micro surprise. Even yeah. though you weren't just in the dark the whole time, and where did that triangle come from? It's not that. Yeah. It was just for that little little split second. Little split second. Micro little surprises. micro surprise. It's a surprise. That works. Less. Hey, back to this um, maneuver. Mm-hmm. Like. I feel like that's like, and I learned this from you where, put simply, you say, hey, build the relationship, right, Mm -hmm. with people. Like, you're like, hey, my boss won't listen to my input or my coworker won't, you know, listen to my my strategy, which is awesome and all this stuff. You're like, hey, because you're just going straight. You got to create a relationship. You got to get into the position, you know? I just got this question today. I was getting interviewed and the guy's like, you know, that guy's like, well, I mean, what happens when? And you can see it's already, it's like it's like when someone says, well, you know, it's like in jiu-jitsu when someone yeah. says, well, you know, what, 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 if if the guy, what if the guy does this? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. so the guy says, well, you know, what happens if you get told to do something by your boss and you don't agree with it and he just says, do it my way anyways, yeah. right? And I'm like, well, I don't get in situations like that. Why? Because I've spent the last six months, eight months, one year building a relationship up with my boss where when my boss tells me to do something that I don't believe in, I say, hey, boss, I don't know if this is a good idea. How about we do this a different way? My boss says, oh, thank you, Jocko. Yeah. Thank you for not allowing me to tell you to do something that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So you're right. It's a preemptive a preemptive maneuver to be in the right position right so position. that you will not get told to do something. Now, does that mean I haven't done a bunch of things that I didn't want to do leading up to that point? Yes, absolutely. That's called building leadership capital. Yeah. I'm going to make my boss win over and over and over again. Yeah. No one wants to hear that. Yeah. I just got asked it when, when, when Leif and I were out in Staten Island. A guy's like, you know, what can I do to lead people that are, that, that don't want to, you know, do what I want them to do? It's like, man, you got to build relationships with those guys. Yeah. You can't bark orders at them. It's not going to help. Yeah. It'll help for a minute. Yeah. Like, they'll load that truck up but they're looking for another job. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You gotta build relationships with these people. Yeah. Up and down the chain of command. And you know what that is? That's maneuvering. You are correct. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was critical. Or critical, yeah, but really helpful because again, that's one of those things where you gotta you gotta detach, you gotta you gotta kinda step outside and be like, hey, Cause that okay to build a relationship with your boss. No one thinks like that. That's the solution to the problem because directly it's kind of not. 
even though no, it's no. probably a, a a huge, huge. Yeah. Why would you say directly? It's not because it straight up is. Well, it doesn't seem like it. Put it that way. Why? Like, look, well, if you just think kind of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, linearly, like if I'm like, hey, I want Jocko to listen to my input, right? right? A direct approach would be like, hey, Jocko, take your headphones off, listen to my input. That's like a direct. So if I go indirect, right, that's more like, hey, I got to build a relationship first. Then I can, it's basically adding another step. But that step is like this straight up requirement. Yeah. And, and and the thing is, this it's not a step, it's a broad underlying fundamental situation that you set up for success. Yeah. yeah. And and then there's this whole thought that because I and I've said this on here many times, I say it all the time. I built relationships with bosses that I didn't like. Yeah. Right. And people go, oh, well, Jocko's an ass kisser. Yeah. And Jocko's a brown noser because he's just trying to build a relationship with his boss. And I always say, no, I'm not a brown noser. No, I'm not an ass kisser. I'm winning. I'm here to win. That's yeah, what I'm yeah. here to do. You know what I'm here to do? Take care of my platoon and make sure that they can have what they need to accomplish our mission to the best of our ability. If my if I have an antagonistic relationship with my boss, can I truly support my platoon? The answer is no, all day long. Yeah. He's not going to give me the gear that we need because he doesn't like me. He's not going to give me the training that I need because he doesn't like me. Yeah. So why is he going to give me what I need? He's not. But if I have a good relationship with him that I built, then guess what he's going to do? He's going to let give me what I need to accomplish my mission. Yeah. He's going to give me what I need to be the most effective platoon we can have. Now, where does it cross the line? Where does where do, where does Jocko become a brown noser and an ass kisser? Because we know these people exist, and I'll tell you exactly where the line gets crossed. The line gets crossed where I'm kissing my boss's ass so that I can get promoted or I can yeah. get taken care of or I can take care of myself. Yeah. If that's what game you're in, yes, you're an ass kisser. I don't like you because yeah. you're doing it for you. It's like the difference between manipulation and leadership, yeah. right? If you're doing, if you're, if you're influencing people so that they do something that's going to help the team and help the mission and help them, that's influence. If you're doing something, if you're influencing, or that's leadership, if you're influencing people so that you can help yourself, right. And benefit yourself. That's and it doesn't help the team, and it doesn't help the mission. That's manipulation. Yeah, yeah, fully. Yeah, when you go outside of the scope of like the broad goal, you know, and everyone can see it. By the way, everyone see it from can a mile see away. It. Everyone can see it. Everyone can see it. Yeah, everyone can see it. And what's really jacked up, or it's not even jacked up. What's kind of cool is if you're looking out for the boys and you're looking out for the mission and you're doing everything for their for their for the best for their best that shows through too. Yeah. And when that shows through, guess what? Your people, your boss wants to take care of you cuz mm. you're trying to win yeah. for him. Yeah. Not for you. So. Yeah, but the way you say it, I mean, obviously you're 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 not new to this concept, but no, you know, I and not. you're not new to the concept of when you're in the situation. If you don't like the person, and now Jocko wants me to build a, a good relationship with this person that I don't like or whatever, bro, I'm not keeping it real. That's why it's oh, that's why it feels yeah, like. What am I do? Like, what am I be like? This two faced guy. You think yeah. I'm gonna be, give him totally. the, my respect, my valued, coveted respect yep. no man that's i'm i keep it real i keep it too real no, too real, too to real for that i'm not yeah. i'm not bowing down to that guy <laughs> yeah, can't do it cool so you're gonna lose yeah so you'd rather lose yeah see but when you put it into perspective again that perspective that you put it in which is which i did what's 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 interesting just to just to take that to one more level if you're the guy that's like hey i got too much pride to do that i'm not yeah. doing that i'm not bowing down to him okay so you're gonna lose because yeah. to me i look i don't just look at it like one hit like right. that's the end of the game the game doesn't end there the game ends when I'm on top with the big win. <laughs> and you know what? My uh -huh. ego, my ego won't allow me to let my ego interfere with the fact that I want to win. Right, right. The big game. Yeah, yeah, the long game. Playing Gotta play the game. long game in this one. In do. all of them. Yeah, man. Maneuver. Yeah. A little yeah. bit of maneuver. Maneuver. Yeah, if you can get into a habit, like you kind of, su not surprise, you surprise straight up, surprise me, oh, because I forgot, by the way, because it's not as, doesn't come as natural with one of your answers at the at roll call when you were like, hey, build a relationship. Oh. Like you're, 
you know, this person is, uh, you know, you remember the situation, yeah. right? The person didn't, like, he didn't follow through as much as he should have and because he's so, so good, you can't tell him anything kind of thing. Right. And then it's like, no, you got to, you can't, like, harp on this guy. You got to build a relationship with him. I was like, ah, dang, yeah, I should have remembered that yeah. one. Like, because that's a lot of, the, most of the time, that's the answer. If you have yeah. a problem with somebody, like, not doing it, you know, like, yeah. just like I used to say. But it Wait, you're like saying that. most of the time, most of the time, what people think they should do. Like, how should I confront this person? Yeah. Should I fire them? To do what I when want them to yeah. do. Yeah. How can I confront them? Should I fire them? What should, it's like, oh, you know what you should do? Build a relationship with them. Yeah. Make them understand. Make yeah. you understand where they're coming from. Can you lead someone that you don't understand? Not really. Yeah. Here's another one. You get someone. If, if you're, if, oh, oh, this person that works for me thinks it's all about him. What should I do? You should make him think it's a, that everything's about him. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's yeah. the black belt move. <laughs> the black belt yeah. move is like, yeah, you're damn right. This is all about you, and here's how you're going to win. Yeah. And by the way, the whole team's going to be winning because you're winning, but yeah, we yeah. don't worry about that. We're yeah. worried about if your perception is that, oh, Echo, Echo thinks this is all about him. Guess what I'm going to make Echo think? He's right. That's right, yeah, yeah. And he's going to be busting his ass because it's all about him. <laughs> yeah. And the team is going to, well, Echo's going to win, which means the team's going to win, which means I'm going to win. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. All you got to do is step back six to eight inches from the from the from the front line I know, to take bro, a look around and see that it's pretty far six to eight inches when you and know this is the other thing no one wants to hear those answers no no they don't Actually. i shouldn't say no one but most people don't want to hear those answers yeah because th- the fact of the matter is is it's your fault yeah and when, it doesn't when you're like, when your person is not doing what they're supposed to be doing it's your fault hey do you get the person that just has a totally negative attitude that shouldn't be on the team Yes, they exist. Yeah. I get that. Mm. Whose responsibility is it to get rid of them? It's yours. You're the boss. Yeah. If they're not that person, whose responsibility is it to get everything you can out of them? It's you. You're the boss. Yeah. People don't like to hear that answer. No. It's a hard answer because yeah. you want to throw whatever, you know, oh, oh, the millennials, the big one, right? Yeah. The millennials are freaking horrible. <laughs> It's like, oh, well, maybe if maybe if maybe if you were a better leader, mm-hmm. the millennials would be on board. Yeah. Maybe. It's a hard thing to face. Yeah. But if David Hackworth and Jim Mukayama can get draftees in Vietnam to go and risk their lives and fight the enemy and possibly get wounded or killed mm-hmm. in a war they don't believe in, mm-hmm. if they can do that through good leadership, I think you can get a millennial to get get after it yeah and by the way there's millennials getting after it everywhere i meet them all the time yeah they're not like hey i didn't hey it's good to meet you i'm glad you're putting out word about how to be lazy no (laughs) they're like i am gonna crush the world yeah they're out there yeah takes a little bit yeah yeah what it takes it takes leadership that's what it takes i'm sorry leadership is not easy people the millennials don't want to listen who wants to listen I was more rebellious than any millennial I've met. Mm. I can see that. Yeah. Anyways. So, next. Security. Security provides readiness for action or counteraction and is enhanced greatly by flexibility. Flexibility in mind, organization, and means contributes to security. Its attainment embraces all measures designed to avoid being surprised or interfered with seriously and the retention of freedom of action. Security does not imply undue caution and avoidance of all risks. Important, right? Security does not imply undue caution. So there's a dichotomy here. It doesn't imply the avoidance of all risks. For bold action is essential to success in war. And what does bold action require? It requires risks. Otherwise, it wouldn't be bold. When security is provided, unexpected developments will not seriously interfere with the attainment of the mission. Check. So, got to maintain security. That makes sense. So, those are the nine principles. Those are the nine principles of war. That's as they existed. Now, they also talk about, and there's a debate right now, going around of whether whether a flexibility should be the tenth principle. Some people think it should, some people think it shouldn't. And then in 2011 they added some principles to joint operations. And here are those principles. Number one is 
restraint to limit collateral damage and prevent unnecessary use of force so now we're getting into minimum force right Mm -hmm. restraint requires careful and disciplined balancing of the need for security the conduct of military operations and the national strategic end state makes sense yeah that's where they came up with this you have to put that minimum force that's what that is that's the same thing right and I think the key to that they put on the end the national strategic end state so what does that mean sometimes if you use too much violence if you as a bouncer use too much violence your your goal of the, your mission as a bouncer is to keep the place safe yeah if you use too much violence people don't want to go there because the bouncers are, are, are assholes yeah. right they're beating everyone up yeah. that's a problem yeah. so what's our strategic end state is that we keep this place safe mm-hmm so that's why they they're talking about that yeah. same situation. They actually changed our name from bouncers to uh, first it was hosts. <coughs> Wait, what was it? Yeah, it was hosts. They call it. You're not bouncers, yeah. you're hosts. And then what they change it to? Uh d- door host. Oh, no, no. Okay, they went bouncers. They, no, you're a doorman now. You're just a doorman. Uh, yeah, doorman. Then doorman, they're like, yeah, no, door cool. hosts uh, fits like the personification of this place. Yeah. You know, like you're just a host. Yeah. That was a good try. It's, it's, like it's interesting, though. Guy. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because that's a little leadership maneuver that they're doing. They're trying to. Now, they didn't do a good job because you're joking about it, right? You thought it was a joke. You're like, well, this is the, ridiculous. The, the thing is, I, I actually wasn't mad at it ultimately. I was like, that that totally makes sense because when you think bouncer, you think dive yeah, yeah. bar guys beating up guy like Roadhouse, right, right. you know, bouncing these guys out the on off the wall. Out Roadhouse the talks about minimum force, though, right? Oh, yeah. Dalton. Oh, but yeah. what does he say? He said, be nice. Oh, that's like the rule, right? Be nice. And he's like, uh, ask him to walk, but be nice. If he doesn't walk, walk him, but be nice. If he if he still won't walk, get another guy to help you walk him, and you will both be nice. And he said, you be nice until it's time to not be nice. That's what he oh, says. Oh, that's, that's a <laughs> super badass, right? Yeah, bro, yeah, Look man. at you. You couldn't, you couldn't even hold it back, <laughs> bro. You couldn't hold it back. Come on, bro. bro, that's like the... the you what do you, couldn't what? hold it back, that smile. <laughs> that's the like the Bible. What do you call it? Not the Bible, but the movie version of the Bible. You know how you have like... What, what's the Navy SEAL movie? The one you got it. You know, for, for pilots, it's Top Gun. You know, Yeah, I don't for, know if there's a SEAL one. Yeah, it's the one with Charlie Sheen. Yeah, but I don't even know if that's the iconic. Right. It's not as iconic well, a bouncer e- movie as, as Roadhouse is. Bruh, if you're a bouncer and you watch Roadhouse, that's your thing. Yeah, for sure. No, it's the iconic bouncer yeah, movie. Yeah. I don't even, is there even another bouncer movie? I, I don't know. Shouldn't be if there should, is. Yeah. It doesn't even exist, no, really. No, no, Exactly right. <laughs> Check. All right. Next. This is one of the new ones, one of the new principles. Perseverance to ensure the commitment necessary to attain the national st- strategic end state, the underlying causes of the crisis may be elusive, making it difficult to achieve decisive resolution. The patient, resolute, and persistent pursuit of national goals and objectives often is essential to success. What I don't like about that one is it 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 kind of it kind of says it's it's saying like what's the number one rule objective like you got to know what your mission is you got to have an objective and this one is saying look the underlying causes can be elusive it can be difficult to achieve decisive resolution so I guess the the theory or the principle of perseverance means we're gonna continue to do this Mm. my problem with that is that is how do you end up then or do you end up then with a Vietnam where yeah. we're continuing to fight even though we're not quite sure what our end state is what our objective is and it's so elusive that we're not sure where to go that one makes me a little bit hesitant mm. do I believe in perseverance absolutely you keep yeah. going but as I've talked about before don't quit doesn't mean never give up on the, the plan that you came up with and just keep going until you freaking either die mm. or you achieve your goal yeah Next, legitimacy, to maintain legal and moral authority in the conduct of operations. Legitimacy, which can be a decisive factor in operations, is based on the actual and perceived legality, morality, and rightness of the actions from the various perspectives of, perspectives of interested audiences. Together, these 12 concepts form 
principles of joint operations. Now, I'll tell you what's interesting about legitimacy. Obviously, you have to have it. You have to have you, you know moral and legal authority. The problem I the problem I have with that is who, who gets to judge that? Because mm. the per, the people that you're fighting. <laughs> they, they don't agree with what you're doing. Yeah. You're not legitimate in their eyes. Yeah. So how are we coming up with that? I, mm. I think I think we can. Yeah. But I think we have to do that decisively. Yeah. And say, look, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is why. And if there's a bunch of people debating about it, okay, well we're gonna hold off then. Yeah. Until someone says, Oh, you know what? This needs to be stopped or this situation situation needs to end. Because yeah. you do need legitimacy. Yeah. And if you don't have legitimacy, you're going to have problems really, truly accomplishing the mission. Yeah. Yeah. And what well, I mean, kind of in a way, I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions, obviously, but in a way, there's always going to be like some debate. You know how like they'll be like, hey, you know, I'm going to make a generic example, but like, you you know, if hey, some turmoil in this country because of the way these people are treating these other people in this country. Right. Boom. U.S. steps in and all this stuff. Some there's going to be somebody debating hey, like, that's their country. That's how they roll. You know, it's like, who are we to step in and call them, you know, immoral or whatever when that's how they've been living for thousands of years. That's my point. Yeah. That's my point. So, yeah. Who who, gets to make that decision? Yeah. Well, it's a tough one. Yeah. Like almost like a, like a, like a global standard needs to be established. You know, I think that's kind of the. And, and I think you, I think it is actually possible to do that. I think so too. I think it is actually possible to do that. And I think the fact that we sometimes decide that, hey, it's not our place to make that decision. Like, I'll give you an example. ISIS. Yeah. Hey, if you're systematically raping eight-year-old, nine-year-old, ten-year-old girls yeah. and boys, you don't get to do that. Right. We will come and stop you. Yeah. That's the way it's going to be. Yeah, and you need if you need a documented argument for why that is, I think I don't think that'd be a problem to to produce. You know? I think if you need a documented argument for that, you just yeah. made the list as well. <laughs> We're coming after you. I think I agree with you, sir. So, yeah, Nazis. Yeah. Guess what? You don't get to do that. Same deal, yeah. Imperial Japanese army rolling into China, rape of Nanking. Nope, you don't get to do that. Yeah. That doesn't work. We're not okay with that. Yeah. You just made the list. Yeah. We seem to have a harder time doing that. We we seem to think these days that evil doesn't exist. Yeah. And that's wrong. I agree with it's you. wrong. Next next it talks about the application of the principles application the principles of war so that's that's the well it's now the 12 principles but now I'm going from the new principles that were added on sure. back to the 1984 Marine Corps field manual sure. FMFM six tack four rifle company application the principles of war act as a checklist for the commander in order to apply combat power effectively and reduce his unit's vulnerability. A review of military history will demonstrate that those commanders who have adhered to those principles have most often enjoyed success on the battlefield. There you go. I like the fact that they're taking these principles and broadly applying them to the past and saying, look, when this happened historically, you will have victory most of the time. There have been, of course, exceptions to the rule. However, these exceptions prove the rule that any attempt to rigidly apply all the principles to all battlefield environments may lead to defeat. We got a we got a little chapter in the dichotomy of leadership. Mm. It's called disciplined, not rigid. Yeah. Why? Because of what that just said. Mm-hmm. The commander should recognize the need to apply the principles as flexibility as all other tactical principles. Oh, sorry, as flexibly as all other tactical principles based on the circumstances with which he is confronted. Flexibility in the application of principles is as important as flexibility in the application of combat power on the battlefield. Isn't it cool to come up with principles and then just say, "Yeah, you got to apply them like as needed." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a. It shows how much you have to think as a leader. Yeah. 
you have to look at things all the time and sometimes your principles gotta go, I gotta back off that. And that's kind of what we did in the dichotomy of leadership because can you make things too simple? Yes, you can. Yeah. Cover and move, the number one principle. Can you cover and move too much? Yes, you can. Mm-hmm. Prioritize and execute. Can you prioritize and execute too much? Yes, you can. What does that look like? It looks like target fixation. Yeah. What does is, what is cover and move too much look like? It looks like you're stepping on the toes of other elements. Mm. What does too simple look like? You haven't covered all the contingencies. What does too much decentralized command look like? It looks like your people don't even know where you're supposed to be going because you haven't made it clear. Mm. You've let them go too far. Back to the book. No commander can rigidly follow the examples provided by doctrinal resources, but must modify them according to his mission, the situation, and the terrain over which he is fighting. So there you go. Now, what was interesting is I found this in an Air Force manual. So that's that's what I covered from the FMFM 6 tac 4 which is just really good, broad principles of combat principles of war now it was interesting I was looking at a, an Air Force to kind of get their perspective similar perspective not as detailed but one thing that they did that was interesting was they put the other countries principles of war and compared them to our principles of war and th- a lot of them are very very close but one of them that stood out was the, the former Soviet Union and and this is where we get into You know, I was talking specifically about the USSR back in the day, back in the 80s, back in the 70s. You know, this is the other superpower in the world. And they have some interesting theories. And and again, there's a little chart that I found and it it, kind of laid out. You know, so in America, we have objective. In Great Britain and Australia, they say selection maintenance of aim. Right, so understand what your aim is. Mm. We have offense, offensive in Great Britain, Australia, they have offensive action. We have mass, meaning we're gonna use our concentration of force. What does Great Britain and Australia call it? Concentration of force. Mm. We both have economy of force. We call it maneuver, they call it flexibility. We call it unity of command, they call it cooperation, Mm. which is interesting. Cooperation is very similar to cover and move. We both have security, we both have surprise, we have simplicity. They don't have simplicity, but they have another one called maintenance of morale, Hmm. which is an interesting, important thing that maybe we left out. Why do we leave that out? It's an important one. France, they have three, concentration of effort, that's the same as mass, surprise, that's another one. And then their last one, liberty of action, which is interesting, that's decentralized command, right? Hey, you gotta go out and make things happen. China, they have some similar ones. Objective, they call it selection and maintenance of aim. Offense, they call it offensive action. Mass, they call it concentration of force. Maneuver, this is an interesting one. Maneuver, they call it initiative and flexibility. Again, a little bit of decentralized command sprinkled on that. Unity of command, they have coordination, they have security, they have surprise, and their last one is morale, mobility, political mobilization, and freedom of action. Interesting dynamic from China. And then they they listed out the Soviet, the former Soviet ones, because this is one of the largest armies that ever existed, this former Soviet army. army. And as I was reading that this little, this little chart about what the Soviets had, Massing and correlation of forces, economy and sufficiency of force, initiative, surprise, mobility, tempo. Uh, I, I was I was going to this. I remembered reading an old assessment of the Soviet style of warfare back in the day, <laughs> and I remembered it had some interesting takes. And I was able to find this field manual from the eighties. I want to say again, this is these are like from the same time period as the FM that I just read from the Marine Corps. The FM, there's updated ones, which we could cover as well, but these are the old school ones. And again, it's in the 80s. I mean, you wouldn't assess the Soviet Union the same now as you would then. So this, we had a manual, America had a manual called FM 102 TAC 1, 
the Soviet army. And I thought it was kind of worth reviewing some of what th- what they talk about, principles of war, because again, this was like one of the largest standing standing armies in history. It was our major foe. Uh, it was well experienced from World War II. So figure with all that, you know, we probably could learn something from them. So here we go. Getting into the Soviet army a little bit and some of their principles, how they how they rolled. Uh, it introduces it by saying the Soviet ground forces. This field manual describes the operations and tactics of Soviet general purpose ground forces. The content is based on information in Soviet writings and other open source literature. Most available information is focused on potential battle in Central Europe. This is when this was a reality, folks. This is in the 80s. The Soviets believed that any future war could involve the use of nuclear weapons and that the initial stage of the war will be decisive. This is crazy. Tactical tactical nuclear weapons have been assigned at all levels from division up. That's crazy. Wait, so what does that mean? Everybody has nukes? Well... At the division level, so yes, a lot of people have yeah. nukes. A lot of people have nukes. Hmm. Uh, the Soviets have the largest and most effective array of chemical weapons and equipment in the world. They are capable of employing chemical agents from battalion level upward. That's crazy. So a battalion is like the lowest fighting unit that we have. It's hmm. it's. It's, I don't know, 500, 600, maybe 700 guys, generally. Mm. Mm. And imagine 700 guys with, a, with an 05, this is a, probably a 35, 40-year-old guy in charge of it. They got chemical weapons on the battlefield ready to employ. <laughs> and by the way, two levels above them at the division level, that's where we're talking about nukes. nuclear weapons. N- not exactly what I love. Okay, the Soviet front. I had to put this in here. The front is the largest field formation in wartime. It is an mm-hmm. operational and administrative unit, and its size and composition can vary widely depending on the mission and situation. Roughly equivalent to a U.S. or NATO army group. A front could be composed of three to five armies with organic artillery. Missile air defense engineer. The, the reason I found that funny little layer there is I often refer to Echelon Front simply as the front. (laughs) But what what is also interesting, I looked up front to see if that was a commonly used, if see if that definition and and it did they didn't have it listed. They didn't have hey, this is a this is a group, an army group. They didn't Mm -hmm. list it that way. So that's interesting. Learn something new. All right. Um at this time, they're saying that the Soviet ground forces were like 1.8 to 2 million people and 191 maneuver divisions. So to answer your question, 191 divisions. And each one of those 191 divisions had tactical nukes. Get some. <laughs> <sighs> Man. And now we get into, so just, that just kind of lays out how this came together. Okay, the Soviet concept of war. To the Soviets, war is a manifestation of the class struggle. It is an expression of the conflict between progressive forces of socialism and the reactionary forces of imperialistic capitalism, which they feel will ultimately res- be, which, w- which they feel will be ultimately resolved in favor of socialism. The Soviet concept of war represents represents a continuation of politics. Same thing that we have. We you know we think of war as when when politics don't work. Mm. That's when war happens, unfortunately. But yeah, reactionary forces of imperialistic capitalism. <laughs> you know what that is? Mm. That's America, boy. <laughs> uh, that's how the that's how parts of the world view America. Mm. All right. The Soviet military doctrine is officially accepted 
The Soviet military doctrine is the officially accepted set of concepts that delineate the ways and means to achieve military objectives in the interest of politics. The formulation of Soviet military doctrine is a continuous evolutionary process based on number one, communist ideology, number two, Soviet foreign policy, number three, economic and military strengths of adversaries, number four, Soviet resources and geography, number five, history, number six, science and technology. Soviet military doctrine is based on an elaborate integrated system of thought. And then it breaks it down a little bit more. And I kind of had to build that in there because it talks about military doctrine and then it talks about military science is the study and analysis of the diverse psychological and material phenomena relevant to armed combat for developing practical recommendations for the achievement of victory in war. Pretty straightforward. But the reason I had to say talk about military science is because I wanted to get to this point, which is military art. And a lot of times we don't think of the Soviets, right? When you think of the Soviets, what do you think of? I, I, I know what you think of. What do you think of when you think of the Soviets? Come on. When you think of the USSR, what do you think of? You're going to let me down, bro. What? What do what? you think of? When you think of like the, the Russians, what do you think of? They sh- they're strong wrestlers. Okay. Know. As a whole, when you think of the Russians, what do you think of? If you had to characterize the Russians in one individual, who would you think of? Stalin. Ah, oh, close. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Drago. <laughs> okay. Ivan Drago. <laughs> Ivan sure. Drago. The machine, right? Sure. This is what this is. That's what I think of. You know, I think of that. That's what the Soviet Union is. It's like the you know, no emotions, no religion. It's just yeah, yeah. raw. Machines cold, cold yeah. right actually fairly accurate mm. But they go here military art is the most important and primary field within military science and is the basis for strategy Operational art and tactics It is the theory and practice of conducting armed conflict. So they put this high high Respect mm. to the art art probably possibly higher than we do Maybe you know yeah. it is possible all right, so now we get into it and Principles of military art Soviet military theorists consider the following points to be the general principles of military art So that's what that's where I'm going with all this guys gotcha. to get their principles gotcha. They do not represent any special revelation of truth or radical departure from traditional military thought however by their emphasis on these particular points, Soviet military leaders reveal their char- the character of their military thinking and predict the basic characteristics of future Soviet military operations. According to the Soviets, their armed forces must, and here's the list, be fully prepared to accomplish the mission regardless of conditions under which war begins or must be conducted. Next, achieve surprise whenever possible. Sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Military operations must be characterized by decisiveness and aggressiveness. Forces must strive continuously to seize and to hold the initiative. That's good information. Next, make full use of all available military assets and capabilities to achieve victory. Next, ensure that major formations and units of all services, branches, and arms affect through thorough and continuous coordination. Got to work together, cover and move. Select the principal enemy objective to be seized and the best routes for attacking it. Make a decisive concentration of combat power at the correct time, right? Same thing. Next, maintain continuous and reliable command and control. Interesting. The reason that's interesting is that's like a little bit leaning towards centralized control, right? Centralized Mm. command as opposed to decentralized command. But Mm. they're gonna reverse that later. Next, be determined and decisive in achieving the assigned mission. Next, maintain complete security of combat operations. Security, right, same thing. Next, reconstitute reserves and restore combat effectiveness as quickly as possible. Makes sense. Next, well, now it continues on. These are general principles that apply to all three levels of military art, strategy, operations, and tactics. At each of these levels, there are more specific, detailed principles. Soviet military thought subscribes to certain laws of war at the strategic level and principles of operational art and tactics which apply to the actual conduct of combat. So here are the laws of war. 
first law the course and outcome of war waged with unlimited employment of all means of conflict depends primarily on the correlation of available strictly military combatants at the beginning of the war second law the course and outcome of the war depend on the correlation of the military potentials of the combatants third law the course and outcome of war depend on its political content fourth law the course and outcome of a war depend on the correlation of moral political and psychological capabilities of the peoples and the armies of the combatants now I didn't break those down because they actually do it for you in the manual hmm. Here's what, in simpler terms, what these things mean. First law, be prepared. Prepare in peacetime for the next war. Forces in being are the decisive factors. The side with the most and best troops and equipment at the start of the war will win the war. That makes sense, barring any major strategic blunders. Second law, the side which can best sustain a protracted war will win the war makes sense third law the higher the political stakes of a war the longer and more violent it will be that's a good one that's a good one and you got to think about that one from a leadership perspective when you start getting involved in things that have higher stakes this is when people start stabbing each other in the back oh, yeah. so when people get ruthless yeah. so when there's more at stake there's going to be more violence. Huh. Yeah. We don't recognize that sometimes. Hey, this guy's always been cool to me. But all of a sudden, the stakes go up. All of a sudden, we're getting stabbed. Yeah. Or the dirt's coming out, right? Yeah. The claws come out. Yeah. It's always interesting. You get to see people's real true colors, right? Yeah. When things are at stake, when more is at stake, people's true colors come out. The violence occurs. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like when the, you know, the detective shows up at your door. Hey, we got some questions for you. Ah, I don't have time. Whatever. Oh, we could do it here or we could go back to the station. We could go oh, back. all right, all right. You know, then they start revealing a little bit more. Then they're like, "Hey, they don't want to cooperate that much. They say this thing. They say, "Yeah, I was there, but I don't remember all this stuff." Then they say, "Well, hey, if you don't tell us the truth, you could be going to jail. All your freedom now the stakes go up." Off oh, they start t- talking more. See what I'm saying? Then they say, hey, your friend, was he involved? See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, no, no, no. Hey, if you're lying, not only do you go to jail, then, you know, and they d- raise the stakes a little bit. Oh, they rat on their friend, you know? Mm. When, it, when uh, the stakes go up. Go up, yeah, man. The violence increases. Next, fourth law. War aims must be seen as just. Modern war cannot be waged without public support. Very important. Yeah. Very important. Soviet planning and preparation for war reflect a dominant feeling that war is inevitable. This is not to say that the USSR wants war, but that it is preparing for it continuously. The Soviet state is autocratic, militarized, and centralized. Its political and economic systems give priority to military requirements. The state allocates resources and directs production for preparation and maintenance of a war footing. The Soviet Union is prepared to exert itself at great expense to achieve its goal. It is a nation which through civil war, collectivization, attendant famine, and purges inflicted more than 20 million deaths on its own citizens from the Russian Revolution to the start of World War II. It is a nation that endured the loss of 20 million people during World War II. Its tolerance for sacrifice is high. Yeah, that's a little something to think about. Mm. Now what's interesting is what's stronger, that or the core desire and mandate for freedom Mm. that we have here and actually I can answer that question because history has answered that question freedom will win next as the laws of war dominate strategic 
planning for war so do principles of operational art and tactics govern the conduct of warfare within a given theater of operations the popular western version of these soviet operational and tactical principles is very brief objective offense surprise maneuver and mass this list does not fairly characterize the basis on which soviet military leaders plan and conduct operations and tactics just as they add new equipment to their forces without abandoning older equipment the soviets have modernized operational and tactical pr- principles without fully abandon abandoning their earlier ones a good place to begin is with those classical principles that were taught by the czarist general staff so these are the classic russian military principles here they go first extreme exertion of force at the very beginning of the war next simultaneity of actions next economy of forces next concentration next chief objective the enemy's army next surprise next unity of action preparation energetic pursuit security initiative and dominance over the enemy's will strength where the enemy is weak and that's the list that's the old classic list and it breaks it down a little bit the most significant points of this list are first he who gets to the initial battle with the most wins that's Sun Tzu by the way Hmm. the enemy must be confronted with more than one situation to deal with oh that's that's how I got arm locked all those years ago I was dealing with that choke and there came the arm lock Next, one should not be diverted by geographical objectives, but should concentrate on the destruction of the enemy's military forces. Next, detailed exacting preparation must precede an attack. Design actions to preempt your opponent and keep him reacting to situations that you control. Concentrate on the enemy's weak points rather than his strengths. Contemporary military Contemporary Soviet military theorists hold that nuclear weaponry and other means of modern warfare have modified these basic principles. By the early 1970s, the following principles dominated Soviet operational art and tactics. So they little made these adjustments for nuclear war. First, mobility and high rates of combat operations. Next, concentration of main efforts and the creation of superiority in forces and means over the enemy at decisive place and at the decisive time. Next, surprise and security. Next, combat activeness. That's a good one, combat activeness. Next, preservation of the combat effectiveness of friendly forces. Next, conformity to the conformity of the goal to the actual situation. That's a good one. Conformity of the goal. To the actual situation what that means is your goal can change mm-hmm. and it can change based on the situation you're in yeah that is important and the last one is coordination which you know is basically cover and move now it goes on a melding of contemporary writings and those of the recent past plus an influence of significant classical Russian principles results in the following specific Soviet principles of operational art and tactics and we go into a long list the offensive is the basic form of combat action only by a resolute offense conducted at a high tempo and to great depth is total destruction of the enemy achieved so we need to go hard we need to go fast yeah. next combat maneuver units must be mobile and capable of rapid movement next fire support command and control and logistics must be as mobile as maneuver units that makes sense conduct or conduct thorough and continuous reconnaissance find the enemy's weak points yes perform a thorough estimate of the situation and make timely analytical decisions be realistic consider the mission enemy your own combat power terrain weather and light conditions and time so yeah you got to look at the situation you got to look at best thing about that and you don't hear this very often Mm. be realistic Mm. how good advice is that it's damn good advice be realistic you don't hear that often enough next 
plan and prepare extensively and in detail. That's a good idea. As we know, though, you can go to the extreme with that. You can Mm -hmm. overdo it. The planning and conduct of an operation must involve the full coordination and cooperation of all commanders involved. Man, that's important. If you're coming up with an operation, you got to involve the commanders, the people that are going to be in the operation with you. You can't just send them an email of how you want it to go down. That's not going to work. There must be unity of command, a signal commander for every operation. Boom. We already talked about that. Fully orchestrate all of the all available combat means in a coordinated, cooperative, combined arms effort. Makes sense. Next, deceive the enemy. Attack from an unexpected direction at an unexpected time. Check. Use terrain and weather to your advantage. Check. Strike early with great force. Check. Constantly strive to preempt and dominate the enemy. Again, I always think, when I hear that, I always think of jujitsu when someone's getting the upper hand on you and mm. you can't dig your way out of it. Mm. Attack the enemy violently and simultaneously throughout his depth. Carry the battle to the enemy rear with swift penetrations by maneuver units, fire, aviation, airborne, and helleborne assaults, and by unconventional warfare means. Be bold and decisive. Seize and hold the initiative. Isn't it amazing that just being aggressive goes so far? (laughs) If you are just get the upper hand, I mean, if you get the upper hand, you just have it. And you just need to maintain it. How do you maintain it? It's by continuing to be aggressive and not sitting back on your haunches when you got the upper hand. I do that in jiu-jitsu sometimes. What, sit back on your haunches? Yeah, get a little bit of an advantage, relax too much. Right. Let, Let a little, you know, let a little time give that person time. You know when you see it as an MMA, when somebody gets dazed right. and the person lets them recover, takes them a minute, takes them a minute and 30 seconds, they don't get on that person. Yeah. Got to do that. Prosecute an operation relentlessly without pause under all conditions of visibility or NBC contamination, that's nuclear, biological, and chemical contamination. Doesn't matter. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Russians. This is good. Keep the enemy under constant pressure and off balance. Do not allow him to react effectively. Obviously, jujitsu. Fully exploit the effects of nuclear or chemical strikes with deep attacks by all available forces. I wonder what these guys were thinking. Mm. They're thinking about how they're going to follow up the nuclear assault. (laughs) Bro. (sighs) Whenever possible, achieve mass by concentrated mass nuclear or non-nuclear fires rather than by massing maneuver forces. (laughs) What that is actually saying is instead of using your troops, use nukes instead to get the upper hand. (laughs) Good Lord. How did it get to this? I mean, we, we can look back on it now. I hope. I mean, because there's obviously nukes everywhere still. Yeah. But man, I hope people aren't sitting around plotting right now, coming up with the tactics. I mean, obviously we have to. You have to. Yeah. You have to game it out. Yeah, makes sense. But man, I hope we got some other avenues of approach <laughs> before we're jumping into the wa- nuke launches. <laughs> yeah. Next, if maneuver forces must be massed, do so rapidly. Disperse them as soon as possible after the task has been achieved. Maneuver first with firepower. Firepower is maneuver. Cover and move. Get some. Maneuver forces should attack the weakest points in the enemy defenses. Yes, Sun Tzu. Thank you. We agree. If necessary, create weak points or holes with nuclear or (laughs) non-nuclear fires. Bypass enemy strong points to strike deeply into his rear. Yeah. Hey, you know what? We, we're going to create a weak, weak point with nukes. Get some. Yeah, it's, it's funny to hear that, how like nukes is just sort of one of the They're options. just throwing it out there. Yeah, yeah. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. We're not talking like, hey, is anyone going, hey, by the way, that's the end of the world? <laughs> hey, hey, Colonel. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Colonel, I, gotta, I just want to bring something up. You realize that we all die when this happens, right? <laughs> like this isn't, this isn't like a good plan. Your plan yeah. sucks. Yeah, like, hey, we got to, hey, there's a little, we got to create a weak point, like, right over there. Hey, we should send, like, 
like you know like maybe 12 guys or something yeah maybe over or we could just use those nukes <laughs> over here yeah, just or, use those or maybe uh, yeah. i'm gonna send this document to uh Jordan Peterson, because because you know you know how he's all paranoid about nu- nuclear war when he was in college, and that's kind of what sent him down this path of how could we get to this situation. Yeah. <laughs> I think this what? is gonna, this is gonna really disturb him. Yeah. It's like, hey, boss, look, check you, this out. These guys weren't it? playing. Yeah. yeah, guess how we're gonna create a little weakness? We're gonna nuke them. <laughs> nuke them, man. Mm. <sighs> scary. It's very scary. Avoid frontal attacks wherever possible strike the enemy in the flanks of the rear obviously we're all about flanking maintain security of your own flanks maintain sufficient follow-on force to assure achievement of the mission and to, and to deal with contingencies maintain honor uninterrupted combat support maintain effective continuous command and control and communications that's getting a little bit you know that's important but sometimes I think that they were very centralized and you can see that from when they fought in Afghanistan that they definitely had some centralized command going on mm-hmm. and the units that performed well were the units that were the most decentralized which was generally their special operations units maintain redundant communications at higher levels rely rely on audio and visual signals and well rehearsed battle drills at lower levels staffs at every level must have equipment and skills necessary to collect and analyze information quickly Employ radio electronic combat to deprive the enemy of effective command and control of his combat forces. That means they're going to use jammers and whatnot. Mm. Adhere, now this is where it's interesting. So, as much as I talk about centralized command, adhere to the spirit and letter of a plan. If the plan fails, use initiative to accomplish the mission. Check, that's decentralized command. Mm. You can only do that if you actually know what the mission is. Mm. Next, be prepared to react effectively to a rapidly changing battlefield. Check. Develop procedures to deal with numerous contingencies. Check. Think quickly and be decisive and resourceful in accomplishing the mission. Check. Conserve fighting strength through the use of combat vehicles with collective NBC protection. Again, that's nuclear, biological, and chemical protection. Dispersal of forces. Minimum combat power necessary to accomplish a task. The use of captured enemy equipment and effective logistics. And then that's the end of the list. Obviously, it's a pretty broad list, uh, but very interesting. You can see the parallels. You can see how the same themes come up over and over again. And it says this, these principles are idealistic. They are what the Soviets strive to achieve. They show what the Soviets would like to do, but not in all cases what they may be capable of doing. However, the principles serve as a basis from which any examination of Soviet operations and tactics must start. And again, it's just crazy to read about this. Nuclear warfare implications. The advent of nuclear weapons caused Soviet planners to go through a long period of rethinking and revising their combined arms doctrine. Modern, totally mechanized armed forces supported and threatened by weapons that can change the face of the battlefield in a matter of minutes gave a whole new meaning to the high-speed combined operations in depth. Uh, when we talk about combined combined operations or combined arms in in the military, we talk about you know we're going to use mortars and we're going to use artillery and we're going to use air support and we're going to use you know heavy machine gun fire. We're going to use all those together in co- coordination to to catch our enemy in the combined arms dilemma where there's no way to get out of it. It's like checkmate, yeah. right? I never ever thought about hey. Let's get him in the ultimate checkmate over here on this one. Bring in, bring in the tactical nukes. Again, just just to point out that under nuclear threatened conditions, the Soviet offensive concept would have the following features: avoid concentrating forces, concentrate fires, but not firing weapons. Attack across broader frontages on multiple axes. Avoid enemy strong points. Probe for enemy weak points. Penetrate where possible. Commit follow-on forces when and where they can best contribute to success. Drive rapidly and deeply into the enemy rear to destroy nuclear weapons and enemy forces. And just to wrap this up, because I thought this was interesting. And I, we're not covering a bunch of this book, just like we barely covered any of the Marine Corps rifle uh, manual, but norms, initiative, and flexibility. Soviet military doctrine includes a system of performance standards. 
expressed in numerical forms called norms. Norms define the ideal performance in a multitude of tasks and conditions. I've talked about task conditions and standards on here before. They are used to determine such things as intervals, rates of march, frontages, logistics requirements, fire support, and training drills. Norms provide a mathematical prescription for proper action. So this is where we get to, you know, I start thinking of that Soviet stereotypical, like, hey, we're just going to, here's the numbers, plug them in, and that's what we're going to do. They are formulated by historical analysis, training exercises, requirements, and gaming models. Based on norms, a given situation has an approved response. The correctness of a commander's action or his troop's response is often measured by their adherence to the established norms for that situation. The advantage of this system is that it provides a high degree of combat readiness, at least in the initial stages. Drills at the subunit level, battalion or lower, are well rehearsed. The tactical level commander is aware in advance of how well his troops can cope with time and space factors. The, and so there's, there's what's good about it. You have everything like laid out like this is what we do in these situations. Back to the book, the obvious disadvantage to strict adherence to norms is less provision for the unexpected. If a situation arises for which there is no established normative response, a lower level commander might find himself in peril, which I totally agree. That's why I made the training super hard and crazy for the guys that I put through training so that they were ready for non-normative situations. Mm. The topic of initiative receives much attention in Soviet military writings. When a plan fails, commanders are strongly urged to use initiative as a cure-all. The Soviet perception of initiative involves finding a correct solution following normative patterns. If the commander adheres to norms and is successful, he is praised. If he violates normative patterns and fails, he is condemned. <laughs> so what, what kind of a decentralized command do you end up there? No one wants to take any risks. Success, however, is most important. If commander solves a problem by his own devices, he is lauded. So that's cool, but if you're f- afraid that if you make a call, and it doesn't go right, and you're going to get in trouble for that, you know what you're going to do? You're not going to make a call. Yeah. And that's what crushes your decentralized command. Yeah. Isn't that like a good um, tactic or whatever for like kids where, you know, like if they make an honest mistake, you don't just hammer them, you know, you kind of correct them or whatever. Um, otherwise, yeah. yeah, they're not going to want to like venture out and, and do things, you know? Yeah, totally. And, and this... Yeah, you have to you have to allow your kids to make some mistakes. I I've been saying lately you got to let allow your kids to brush up against the guardrails of failure yeah. without smashing them. Yeah. The bumps and bruises are what are what are what go is going to make them formidable in life. Yeah. If they never got a bump or a bruise, life's going to hit them hard. Yeah. They won't be conditioned for it. Yeah. And this thing wraps up just saying these concepts are not descriptive of a rigid offensive doctrine, but one that is both mobile and flexible. So there's a little something from the from the Soviet army. And, and obviously, like I said, the principles of warfare. While they're nuanced and they're stated differently, they're the same. I mean, you see the same patterns over and over again, and they apply to war and they apply to life. And so I think it's important to see them from different angles so that you can understand them because if you understand them broadly, well, then you can see them in all things. (laughs) And if you see them in all things, then you can actually apply them in all things, which is important because that's what's going to make you better. It's going to make your jujitsu better. It's going to make your business better. It's going to make your team better. It's going to make you a better leader. It's going to make you better, and it's going to make your life better. And these, these principles have been around for a long, long time. So... That's the that's the Soviet maneuver warfare doctrine. And you know, I also recently had to do some maneuvering myself. Sure. <laughs> A little bit of maneuvering and I, I wanted to uh bring it up because it's interesting. A little bit of aggression. A little bit of maneuver warfare. So I wrote another book. And the book is called Mikey and the Dragons. It's another kid's book. It's for younger kids, maybe a tad younger than the warrior kid crowd, right? So we're talking like four, five, six, seven, eight-ish, something like that. However, 
like the Warrior Kid books, there's lessons for everyone in there. Yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. and so what's interesting, so I wrote this book. I had, to, I had like a vision. Does that sound too much? Uh, yeah, when you say it, but, you know, I dig it. Okay. I, I had a vision of, of this book, what the story was, right? And I wrote it. I wrote the first half. The original idea just, like, hit me, and I just wrote it. Yeah. Like, the first half of the book. And then a couple weeks went by. Because I wasn't quite sure about the ending exactly. Mm. And then one night I woke up at 3.30 in the morning. I had the whole thing, the rest of it, and I sat down and I just wrote the rest of it. It was like overflowing from my brain. And I just literally, I just woke up and I wrote the, it took yep. me like two hours to finish it. Overflowing from your brain and yep. your heart and your soul. Yeah. Mm, I don't know about all Come that. Come on, bro, wake up 3.30 in the morning. Come on, that's like, a, what do you call it? Like an inspired creative genius type scenario. Well, I don't know about all that. <laughs> come on, bro. Come on, come on. But when I got done, I was, I could, I realized, like, I liked it. Like, I realized it was something, right? Sure, I, knew, was, I knew it wasn't yeah. nothing. <laughs> yep. And as soon as my wife and kid, my wife and my youngest daughter woke up that day, mm -hmm. and I was like, hey, let me read this to you. And I read it to them. And I could tell, because as soon as I got done reading it, my daughter was like, read it again. But what was even funnier <laughs> was my wife was looking at me, and the look on her face was basically a look of like, I can't believe that you actually wrote that. Yeah. She looked real suspect. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, mm. you know, I was waiting for her to say, oh, you, where'd you find that? Because yeah, you didn't yeah. write that. Right, right. And I so was like, no, I actually did write it. And, I, and I, I read it to one of my SEAL buddies who's got a like really monotone voice, but he's got young kids and I'm awesome friends with him. And I got done with it. And I was like looking at it as I was looking. I'm, as I'm reading, I'm not looking at him. I'm looking at it, right? And I get done, and he's got this like classic monotone vo voice, and he's like, "How did you even do that?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." So that's kind of you know he was stoked on it. Right. And then I read it to you. Yes. And well, you heard it, Mikey and the Dragons. Yeah, I knew. Was... When I first read it to you. Well, your... you read me when it wasn't even done yet. Oh, and it was like I was like, dang! I was in first. I kind of on a superficial level. I was impressed with your ability to like actually rhyme stuff. Oh, that's right, because it rhymes. Yeah, because you know how some you know one time like I don't know me. I, I'm gonna bust out some rhyme I made up. It's gonna be so far fetched. It's like, bro, you do, <laughs> right, just do better with that. You know, kind. Of, but yours is like it. It all fits. It's like, yeah, I, I understand how your friend was like. Like, how did you do that yeah. or whatever? You know, because it's just that you can't just throw words together that rhyme. But um, yeah, so here the first version without the be without the ending oh, kind of thing. End. I read that and to you, I was like, just the beginning. Yeah, oh, and you were like, "Hey, there's more, and there's an ending or whatever that I didn't quite, you know." Yeah. I was like, "Dang, that's that's good. That is real good, actually." Because and you you because you always have this little message that's like real <laughs> deep, you know, that kind of applies well, to well, like I guess people, not a little message, uh, a huge <laughs> message, and, and it like it, it applies to kids directly, and then it applies to adults yeah. directly, yeah. though. That's the thing. So you know how like okay, so I read kids book i got kids we all know that and th there's kids book but the the message is this real s simple mess i don't right. know there's like a i don't know whatever the the little kid mm -hmm. message mm -hmm. but it's like as an adult i'm not going to read that and be I, I learned that a long time ago mm -hmm. i learned that when i was a kid mm -hmm. so, but these ones even all the warrior kid books or whatever bro, these are adult messages yeah. for kids yeah so that's what that's another thing i was like dang i was thinking that too bro. how do you how do you do that you know <laughs> and then i'm thinking you know what happened you were like scared of some like bugs or something when you were. That's just uh, what I was thinking in my head. I don't know. Maybe or maybe. Wrong. Anyway, so yeah, so the finished one. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I told you this here. When you read the finished one, I was like, "Holy cow, that is that is gold on so many <laughs> levels." So what I did was I stole the story, borrowed it, put uh, it. Down, I borrowed this it. This is what you do. Yeah, I know, but it works. So I borrowed the story. Obviously, I can't memorize the rhyming parts right, right, of right. it, but I understand I just the story. Kind of told and, the story. Yeah, I told the story to my daughter as a bedtime story. And like she's like, oh, she's like, oh, are there she's got all these questions, you know, because she thinks it's real. But man, the lesson is so good. Yeah, so good. Well, uh, from your reaction, from my, and I actually read it to all of my older kids as well, and yeah. got the same thing. Super, just like stoked on it, and yeah. a little bit of like, did you actually write that? <laughs> you yeah. know, that kind of attitude. Yeah. And when I when I when everyone kind of had the same reaction, I was like, okay, I need to get this into kids' hands as quickly as possible because you know it's the archetypical story of a of a kid that as you said needs to overcome some fears and 
it's also a story within a story, right? So basically, the fundamental thing is there's a there's a boy. His name is Mikey. He's scared of everything. That's his basic situation. And here's how he gets introduced in the book. It goes like this. There once was a little boy named Mike, and there were many things in the world that he didn't like. He was scared of spiders and beetles and bugs and always thought they hid under the rugs. They were creepy and crawly and nasty and mean, and he ran from every bug he'd ever seen. But it wasn't only insects that gave Mikey a scare. There were many other things for which Mike didn't care. And that's sort of the opening. So you learn a little bit about Mikey. He's scared. Mm -hmm. Scared of some stuff. And eventually, after you learn about all the things that Mikey's scared of and how he kind of is sad that he's scared of so many things he didn't like it. And he kind of wonders why is he so scared of everything. And eventually he stumbles upon this book. And the book is that there's a book that Mikey calls the Dragon Book. Even though the book itself is called the Dragon Prince, but he flips this book open for a second and he sees pictures of dragons and the dragons are all crazy, mm-hmm. and so he's a little bit scared. But there's also pictures of like a young boy in there that kind of looks like he knows what's up. Yeah, yeah. And so Mikey decides that he's going to read it, and so this is where you get the story within the story, because mm-hmm. then you you turn the page and you see the cover to this other book. Yeah, different font, different voice different situation mm. the pictures look a little bit different that's cool because I, I only saw some of the, I didn't see the completed oh, yeah. book oh, I yeah, saw I like just it. some of the pictures and you know okay. Bozak you know <laughs> he <laughs> yeah. you know, knows Nailed what it. he's doing in there and anyways the story that's within the story is it turns out that there's a, this little prince that lives in a kingdom where the king who was the prince's dad has died and of course everyone's all sad because of that but even more than being sad, they're actually scared because it was the king that always protected the kingdom from the dragons who lived over the hill in the dragon cave. And with the king gone, there's no one to protect the kingdom. The knights are scared. The guards are scared. The only one that everyone is looking to to protect the kingdom is this young prince. And here's how you get introduced to that. To that. But now that the king had died and was gone, there was only one person to fight and carry on. And that person wasn't big or mighty or strong. In fact, he hadn't been alive that long. Now the person who had dragons to chase was just a little boy with a smiling face. Yes, the person that now must stand up and be bold was just a little prince who was only seven years old. (laughs) So the boy eventually realizes he's gonna have to stand up and face the dragons he goes to his father's war chest and opens it up and of course the shields super heavy and the sword is massive he can barely pick him up and now he's even more scared but then he sees at the bottom of the war chest he sees a little note little note from his dad the king the mighty king and the mighty king explains to the son what he has to do to stand up and face the dragons and the note's pretty powerful, in my opinion. Okay. And the prince goes forth into the fray and through those lessons from his dad, and he faces the dragons, and we get a result from that. And then the original character in the story, right? Mikey, he learns also how to face his fears. So that's the basic fundamental story. Mm-hmm. And the way it came together was pretty cool and then the reactions from everyone was pretty cool so like I said I wanted to get it into people's hands as quickly as possible so I talked to my publisher about this and I told him about it and I was in the middle of negotiating some other books with them and they of course were like hey we've already got these books that we're looking at so you know we'll put this one on the back burner and maybe we'll put it out in a year and it was actually was it 14 months Dang, you didn't like yeah, that. I didn't like that. <laughs> I didn't like that. So I said, no, you know, hey, it's all cool, but I really want to get this one out very quickly. I want to get this one out. This was in the summertime. I said, I want to get this one out by. I want to get this one out by. Let's get to get get it to kids by Christmas, right? This is an important lesson for kids to learn. Let's get it to them by Christmas. Let's get it out in November, mm. so kids can get it for Christmas and learn. And they're like, mm, no, and and finally <laughs> go back and forth, and finally the message I get is. I get message from uh, my children's publisher 
because they're focused on other things, it's, it's the way it is, they come back and say, look, there's no scenario, no scenario where this book comes out in November. There's no scenario where that happens. Mm. And I said, Roger that. And then I immediately formed my own publishing company <laughs> called Jocko <laughs> Publishing. Sure. I talked to John Bozak, who did the art for the Warrior Kid books, and he was like, okay, we're going. This is due now. Mm-mm. And he went into hyper creation mode. And the, the, the images are a lot different than Warrior Kid because they're full color and they mm. take up full pages and they're dragons and just awesomeness. And he laid out the entire book and did the art and colored it in about a month and a half. And now the book is, in fact, coming out in November. <laughs> so. In the past, when I would talk about pre-ordering book, you know, so you get the first edition and whatnot, and I would always say the publisher doesn't know, needs to know how many books to print, which is true. Now the person, the publisher, the person that needs to know how many books to print is actually me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to get some, you need to order it. Uh, people might think that this is dumb on my part, which is fine to do this it's, it's like a lot of taking on a lot of extra work probably won't make as much money should have done it on the normal publishing release cycle so you can get more like they have a whole cycle the way they average there's a whole thing yeah there's a whole thing to make the book more popular and all this stuff right mm. and I just had to look about it the bottom line is, is I don't really care about that and I'll tell you what after doing book signings and you see what the warrior kid book does for kids I don't care about anything but trying to get this book into as many kids hands as possible if I make less money whatever if it doesn't make the New York Times bestseller list whatever because this isn't about making money or it isn't about making the list or whatever it's it's about these kids it's about teaching kids a core lesson at a young age so that they can have a better life pretty straight pretty straightforward Aim, goal, mission. Yes, sir. So if you got a kid, or you know a kid, or you just want to get after it and support the, the cause over here of discipline and of justice and strength and of overcoming fears, because that's what the book is about, then jump on Amazon. Order this book. It's called Mikey and the Dragons. And I appreciate that, because it'll help a lot of kids out. And that is, no matter what, a good thing to do in this world. No matter what kind of judgment you want to put, if you can help out a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a four-year-old little kid, Mm -hmm. man, that's worthwhile to me. So, Mike and the Dragons, get some. Now, obviously, we're going to help some kids get on the path with that one. Um, maybe Echo. Yes. You could recommend some ways to get the, you know, basically the masses yeah. a little bit tighter on the path. Yeah. Keep, you tell me. And keep us on the path, really, <laughs> when it comes down to it. I like it. Yeah. So, yes. So, obviously, well, it is obvious, like I said last time, we're going to talk about origin. You know why? Because what? When you think of path, we're thinking what? Fitness. Or how should I say? Capability. I don't want to say fitness or no, whatever. No, it's not just fitness. Yeah, it's like, it's like capability. That's what it is. Capability. Jiu-jitsu. Which is essentially under the umbrella of capability. Somebody asked me today, another interview. Sure. How do you recommend men? It was like one of those men-centric interviews. Yeah, man. How do you recommend men increase their confidence? Yes. And I thought about it for a second. And I I, I was like, at first I was kind of like, um, you know, I don't know that I need to answer this question. This is kind of one of those things. And then I just thought to myself, okay, realistically, how do you increase someone's confidence? Because it's kind of a throwaway question in a way, right? Isn't it a little bit of a throwaway question? It's like, mm-hmm. hey, what magic pill do you have to yes. increase confidence? Right, yeah, right. That, that, that that's, way, the, yes. that's the answer that I think was was being hoped for. Yeah, let's hear Jocko's version yeah. of this. How do you increase your confidence? Yeah. And let's put that as a 
as a damn bullet point right. on the clickbait, yeah. right? Yeah, so. Navy SEAL tells you how to increase your confidence, right? <laughs> it, yeah. Right? It's Got a it. clickbait yep. all day long. Yeah. So I don't like those kind of things. But I thought about it for a second. I thought to myself, okay, where does confidence come from? And then I rattled off. I was like, well, first of all, if you want to be confident, then you should do things like exercise and be physically fit. If you're physically fit, your confidence will increase. You tell me, Echo Charles, is that factual or or wrong? That is factual. Okay, so if you increase your physical capability, you'll be more confident. If you learn how to fight, if you learn jujitsu, Muay Thai, boxing, you'll become more confident. Hey, does that sound like I'm a meathead? Maybe, guess what? It's actually true. Yeah. It's actually 100% true. If you're physically capable and you actually know what to do with your physical capability in a confrontational situation, yeah. you will become more confident. Okay, so there's next. What else? Okay, how about we learn to articulate ourselves well? Okay, yes. Will you be more confident if you can speak clearly and concisely and people can understand it? Yes, you will become more confident. How do you do that? You practice, you yeah. rehearse, you carry on conversations, you read a lot so that you have a better vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Once you're done with that, what comes next? Well, do we lack confidence if we are in the unknown? The answer is yes. How do you get more knowledge? You study, you read, you, you, you do your best to learn as much as you can possibly learn and that will increase your confidence because you'll be more comfortable in more different situations because you have more knowledge. Yeah. And the final thing is if you, one way of getting, this is like a, a self-licking ice cream cone, what I'm about to say. <laughs> but if you have the confidence to say, I don't know, your confidence will increase. Yeah. So I can go and get interviewed by anybody because worst case scenario, I'll say, you know, I don't know about that. Mm. I'm not, I'm not, I don't actually don't know anything about that. I'm gonna have to pass on that question because I'm not sure. Am I, is everyone in the world supposed to think that Jocko knows everything in the world? Yeah. Or am I, can I keep, can I, am I humble enough to admit that, you know what, if you quiz me about every subject in the world, I may not know it. Mm. Is that okay? It's fine. No one expects me to be an expert in anything and definitely not everything. Yeah. Like I'm pretty good at a couple things, but not an expert in anything. Yeah. And so if you do those things, you will become more confident. Yeah. I thought that was pretty straightforward. I I think so too. I think that's very uh how should I say informative. Eh, but it kind of that kind of makes it less impactful if I say informative, but yeah. Yeah. Hell there, yeah. There's a, there's a also another aspect and I guess this is covered by the other ones, but like just stepping up and leading sometimes. Yeah. Will get you better at it, yeah. right? Stepping up and talking in a group of people, you'll get better at it. Yeah. So when you say like pra- basically like practice stuff, yeah, rehearsal, right? practice. So, yeah, rehearse, right? absolutely. So the the talking to people that's a big one. Like you know how someone will you'll have like I don't know social anxiety and there's there's it's a spectrum. Some people have massive social anxiety. Some people just prefer not a lot of people be there. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. And it's a spectrum. Um, and and obviously real common, right? So. Yeah, if you want to increase confidence, you say, okay, in regards to the talking part, right, mm-hmm. articulation, practice talking to people like if you go to like the store, this is kind of a little mental exercise mm-hmm. I do. Do you get a lot done in the grocery store? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear the mental One exercise. One of the few things I actually do. In the grocery man. store. <laughs> yeah. How do we increase confidence as a drill in the grocery store? Yeah, go. so, okay, so, and I kind of got it from like being in like Oregon and sometimes in Hawaii where... So in Oregon, right? Okay, so we'll, we'll compare the two scenarios. Right? In in San Diego compared to Oregon. In San Diego, if if I go in in the I don't know frozen food mm-hmm. aisle, mm-hmm. and someone else is there, kind of in front of the peas, whatever mm-hmm. I'm getting, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna politely, hopefully politely, wait for them to finish and leave. Mm-hmm. But put bluntly, that's like I'm gonna wait for them to get out of my way, mm-hmm. and so I can do what I have to do, mm-hmm. and then I'm gonna you know leave. In Oregon. Mm-hmm. 
you go to the frozen food section and someone else is there, they're going to look at you and be, hey, it's almost like an attitude like, hey, you're here too? Shoot, what do you get? You're getting peace too? Mm-hmm. Right on. Like, kind of like, it's like they acknowledge and, for lack of a better term, celebrate the fact that you're sharing space. You know, like, mm-hmm. we're both at the grocery store, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, it's, put it, this is my interpretation of right. the feel, right? right? So I kind of got that lesson and in, on quiet like that too but it's more because everyone kind of knows each other yeah. you know or you know you've seen the guy you're like hey, at yeah. least say hi we you know, know that's the, that's the <laughs> yeah so what i did was kind of try to bring that um i really liked it by the way the like, aloha spirit the aloha spirit <laughs> The law spirit, yes. Um, so now you go in the store and you're sh- kind of sharing the same space. So I'm not saying every single person you yeah. pass, you're bothering them and, hey, how's your, you know, that stuff. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying if you're sharing their space, say something to them, acknowledge them politely, right? Where, yeah. where you have to actively expend energy to Be say nice. something. Yes, but it's not. This is Straight a, from Dalton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying like actively like engage in their, their yeah. world right there, you know? Yeah. So, and that goes for like kind of everyone who's sharing space with you right. whether you know how like you're standing there in line and you guys are just sort of well, you avoid eye contact because you're just on your your thing and they're on their thing and we're gonna stay out of right. each other's way it's not like don't play it like that play it like hey hey like you make eye contact hey say hi you mm-hmm. know kind of thing you didn't try to do it as genuine as possible obviously because you don't want them to think you're gonna like catch them outside and sell them something or something like that and then same thing goes for like the cashier especially if you see them all the time you 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 don't say the generic hey how are you like that kind yeah I don't know, like make it for real. Like you care about like, hey, so how was it today? You know, because, you know, when you're a cashier, you see people after people. Yeah. If it gets crowded, that's something. If yeah. it's real dead, that's something. So you can say, hey, how was it tonight? Was you, know, it crowded? you know what I like I doing? I do that more than just the random people. I don't, I usually leave people alone because I want to be left alone. Right. Uh-huh. And uh, uh-huh. so no, like when no, you see me in the store, don't, don't approach. Don't mess with you. Yeah. yeah stay out of your way, bro. Stay out <laughs> but, of your way. No. Nope. But the cash register, the you know, the waitress, the person behind the whatever coffee thing, or you know, like yeah. I always try and just be nice to them because I know that they're probably having a not nice day. Because when you're the cash register, people are mad at you already just because right. there was a line and you couldn't yeah. find the the, the chocolate chip discounted <laughs> yeah, coupon yeah. thing. Yeah. And so, you know, I like to give them a little acknowledgement that's yeah. all good and that there's actually humans out here that are in the world. And yeah, well, it's the same concept. And I'm j- and the, my point is that that's just where it kind of came from. So the whole but, point of this is just to increase your confidence in communicating with other humans. Yes. Yeah, so when when you, when you do that, the more and more you do that. Uh, the more just I would say comfortable you get just talking to random people yeah. you know like just people it doesn't have to be your best friend to start opening up a little bit yeah. not everything uh, obviously not everything but just just a little bit Check. so now you go into a public place you're no stranger to talking to strangers anymore yeah. you know and the more and more you do it so yeah you get more confident kind of like oh if this guy r- rolls up to me yeah I have no problem talking to this guy I don't have social anxiety Check. yeah what up bro you want to know how my day's going bro I'll tell you how's yeah. that you know, so it's that feeling and it helps. Meanwhile, man. I'm over here. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> All in my way. Yeah, bro. No, bro. Spread the Aloha spirit. Oh, cool. Cool. And speaking of Aloha spirit, what were we talking about? Jiu Jitsu? Well, we, we were talking were, about confidence because about in order to increase your confidence, one absolute 100% way to increase your confidence oh. is to train Jiu Jitsu. Yes. All ages. All genders. Let's just say to say safe for age four and up. Age four and up, yes, correct. Yeah. Age four and up. Below that is like you, there's exceptions for sure. Below but nonetheless, it's playtime. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, which is part of jujitsu too. By the way, as play a time. kid, playtime. Yeah, time. yeah, yes. for sure. It should be fun. Right. Think about this as ju- jujitsu, right? And you'll be able to relate to this. So, you know, like with your friends when you're young, right? Yeah. Little kid. I don't know. Maybe eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah. When you 18, 19, 20, 20 three whatever you when you're drunk at a party with your friends it's all the same deal you guys get in little friendly arguments and it's go time you wrestle in the yard or in the living room then you you're yeah wait till you're in a seal platoon yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you understand it's on exactly right and your parents say hey take it outside it's all this thing you guys fight us in the grass or the dirt whatever yeah and you know who rock can, fights usually <laughs> sometimes yeah usually the bigger brother or you know, the, your friend who's bigger, usually he's going to get you, yeah. right? But it's fun. That's how it always, it's all yeah. fun. And maybe Should you lose your temper. Should maybe you fight, whatever. Yeah. The, all There's always the little brother that can't take it. Yeah, I can't gets, take gets it. Or, yeah, exactly. And he right. tries to, like, kick you in the nuts. So, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean, that yeah, kid? Yeah, I do know He gets mean, all red yeah. in the face, bad sure. temper, got to look out for himself. Yeah. Wants to project the power, even though he's smaller than everyone else because yes. he's younger. 
Sure, that happens occasionally, and which actually fits into what I'm about to say. So what jujitsu is, it's basically that, but the skill that, that, that's required to win at that, you know? So we still have that need, like me and you right now. Your whole point is to say that jujitsu is fun. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so no, but you got to you got to unpack it because it's like you can say yeah, there's a lot of things that you're are gonna fun. just say jujitsu fun. No, I couldn't have said that. No, I couldn't have said that. No, I couldn't have said that. No, the the thing is, but they don't know what kind of fun, you know. So if I say, hey, um, you know, actually, it's more fun than that. Well, here's the it's thing. It's fun. It's fun on a whole different level. Right. Well, hear this though, because here's, it's fun because you're connecting things together that are part of a like grand. Right. It's like being a musician. It's like yeah, hitting yeah, a riff. That. Yeah. Well, yes, there, yes, there's that hundred percent. But I think just as a fundamental kind of, I don't want to say need, but a want is like, bro, like, see how you're even looking at me right now? Like, bro, I kind of want to fight you right yeah, now. In 100%. a, in a, like, <laughs> I don't want to like fight you, like, oh, okay. but that I kind of want to fight you <laughs> <laughs> as a friend. Like, do you want to take it on the match right now? Kind of, kind of thing. Like, if we were like ten years old, you'd be like, what? You want to take it outside and be see down. what up? <laughs> yeah, um, as friends. But that's all jujitsu really is. That's yeah. really what it is. It's like, yeah, let's go on the mat and let's basically fight yep. in a way that we don't burn yeah. our, each other's bridges and, and not be friends anymore. Mm. And then, but on top of that, it's like they teach you the skill, skill to do that. That you can know? literally save your life. Oh, yeah, literally. And yeah. at a minimum, it will increase your confidence as a human. As a human being, yes, sir. Sometimes it gives you too much confidence. Too much, yes, yeah, especially early on. Yeah, especially if you're 13, 14, <laughs> 15. Yeah. 21. Yeah, 21. Whatever. You start thinking you can just smash. <laughs> yeah, kill everybody nonetheless. So if you're training jiu-jitsu. When you're training jiu-jitsu. It, or if you're on the path It might be good to, if you need jiu-jitsu gear, which you do need some jiu-jitsu gear. Yeah. You need what's called a gi. If you need a gi, you can get a gi from our company, which is based here in America. Mm-hmm. And we make gis all American from the ground up, yep. from the dirt. It. It's called Origin Maine, best geese ever in the world too. Yeah, yes. ever, ever in the history of geese. And if you need rash guards, which you can use for jujitsu, you can also use them for weightlifting. You can use them for running and cycling, running, like that's cycling, a big one. Yeah. surfing, yeah. Uh, guitar playing. It might not, <laughs> not might, might not be necessary. <laughs> sure. I do not wear a rash guard when I play guitar. Sure. Maybe, Maybe I should. Maybe. And those are also made here in America. Yep. Along with what else? Just regular clothes too, like shirts and you know some athletic wear. But the shorts that I wear, I only wear. Well, I have one pair of like random camo shorts. Oh, by the way, I gotta get you some. We got some new shorts coming, and you're gonna be very excited about these shorts. Well, I already am because every <laughs> even the 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 error, the mistake shorts that they made, oh, yeah, they yeah, were yeah, my yeah. favorite shorts, yeah. literally ever. <laughs> and then they came out with deliberate shorts that they can actually sell now. Now those are my favorite shorts. So yeah, you say or because you know why about Pete? He cares. Like you don't care about the fashion stuff, but the fashion subtleties it has yeah. to do with fit, fit style. But there's it's subtle though. Yeah. Anyway, they got a bunch of stuff on there, uh, clothing wise as well, like joggers and and you like the joggers. And then they got supplements. We got supplements. Sure. We got supplements. We got joint warfare. We got joint warfare is good if you're working out. If you're on the path, your joints are going to take a beating. Joint warfare will protect them. Yeah. and heal them uh, krill oil another good one discipline good pre-operational get some yes sir. get your mind right yeah. real quick get your body right and then of course we have a little something called mulk yes sir we do what is mulk really simple it's mulk it's mulk yeah so you know um, you know Koa the kid yeah happens to be my cousin mm-hmm He's on the path. Oh. The beginnings of the path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taking the first step. Interestingly, got on the mulk train <laughs> as the first step. That's an interesting oh, that, first step. It is a first, interesting, but here's why, though. When you're not really technically on the path and you just drink mulk, you just think you're drinking a milkshake. See what I'm saying? Yeah, he ju- that's a good point. He's drinking it for the taste. That's a See good point. Saying? Which is good, though, because it'll keep you on the path in, in regards to that additional protein that you're going to get. The Thank original you. flavor was mint chocolate, my favorite. We went to peanut butter from there. Available then vanilla gorilla. Mm-hmm. I don't like plain vanilla. I don't. I just don't like. I don't want to. I don't want to eat vanilla anything. Like you, unless the, unless I'm eating it with some damn chocolate cake. <laughs> I'm not gonna order vanilla sure. ice cream ever. The other day when you had a, a cake 
situation <laughs> cake scenario and some ice cream yeah. what kind of ice cream it was, was it it was vanilla there you go and oh. that whole scenario just unfolded wrong <laughs> it really did i just rationalized the whole thing there lied to myself just and just got after it too, <laughs> <by the way. laughs> but what well, well here's what bummed me out as soon as i was done i was like well i was on the road no milk so when you don't have dessert sometimes you get that little oh i'd like a little something that tastes good to to wash down the steak I had sure. some good steak, yeah. and then and then there's no milk because I'm on the road. I gotta figure that out. I gotta figure that out. People give me good suggestions. I know I can put a little baggie in the thing and just yeah. grab some milk somewhere, mix it up, no factor. Milk so I need to start doing that. Something. Uh, Nonetheless, you don't like vanilla. So no, vanilla is not my favorite flavor. Right. The right, vanilla yeah. tastes good. Yes, sir. I, I I was not the judge on the vanilla. You yeah. know, Pete and Brian were like, hey. The vanilla is awesome. I said I'll try it. It tastes fine. I'm not the judge because I don't want to judge something that I don't fully comprehend. I'm not deserving of being a vanilla judge, yeah. so therefore I didn't do it. And but the darkness, which is chocolate, yeah. the darkness that is also freaking delicious. And when you're getting this stuff, you'll be getting it from Origin Maine. You got Cindy up there. You met Cindy, of course. She's fired up. So when you're getting your stuff packed, it's not just being it's not just being randomly placed in a box in by a robot. Yeah, no, yeah. Cindy's up there. She's getting after it. Okay. And I'm going to say one more thing. Little announce announcement? Sure. Yeah, little announcement. Sure. So you you remember when you were a little kid? Yes. And you loved chocolate milk. Yes, I and do. And you loved strawberry milk. Sure. You loved it so much. <laughs> whatever whatever little brand name yep. that you got and there was a couple of them that yep. were prominent. Sure. And they tasted delicious, and it was like dessert. And for some reason, you didn't really understand why, but your parents would actually allow you to drink it all the time. Yeah. Because your parents thought, well, you know, it's got milk in it, so it's got to be good to go. Yeah, you know, calcium. It's got milk, yeah, it's got, it's got, it's got it'll make their bones strong. Yeah, and there's a little protein in there, so we'll just let them drink it. <laughs> what they didn't realize is that little chocolate and strawberry milk that you were drinking as a kid is completely filled with sugar and high fructose corn syrup and a bunch of other chemicals that they couldn't even pronounce. Mm-hmm. And so the milk that your parents, my parents, were allowing me to drink was actually a freaking net loss <laughs> overall to my health because it was filled with poison. But it tasted good and you loved it. It was like a dessert you could have all the time. But it was filled with poison. So you know what we did? We fixed it. We fixed it, and we now have available at this time Warrior Kid Mulk. (laughs) Yes, Warrior Kid Mulk. We made chocolate and we made strawberry just like you remember when you were a kid, only instead of having a bunch of garbage in it, it's got protein, extra protein, 12 grams. It's got vitamins that you need. It's got probiotics. Because kids are getting told all the time they their parents are getting told they need to take probiotics and here mm-hmm. take this pill and that pill no take yeah, yeah. warrior kid mulk yeah. and there's no sugar in it and it tastes freaking amazing so it's better than any other of these flavored whatever chocolate milk you grew up on this tastes better so now your warrior kid out there can get on the mulk train. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome and again for me to see kids and Be able to help out kids that are four years old six years old eight years old to give them something That's healthy that tastes good. That's gonna make them stronger and Healthier, I mean this is what it's all about. So order up some Warrior kid mulk for your children. Yeah, but yeah my available kids, now my kids going straight on the mulk. Train. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah one speed sure. One way ticket. Okay, does that apply? One way ticket on the mall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand what yeah, I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fully. The, the, the vanilla. Speaking of which, but my son, two years old, by the way, liked the vanilla. Asked okay. for more. Well, there you go. I, I, I didn't know. I'm like, should I give my son that much additional protein? You know. You even questioned that. <laughs> Well, you know, I just don't know a lot of things, you know, as far in regards. Either way, so okay, yes, kids on Mulk Train on the path. Kids are on the path. Yes, straight. They want to be at that book signing. There, there wasn't ma- there weren't many kids there. Yeah, the but ones that I did on the East Coast, lots of kids, yeah. tons of kids. 
I'm, all of them on the path fired up man it was it was amazing every kid there last night at the was on the path huge yeah. time yeah one kid literally tried to challenge me to a jiu-jitsu match on more than one occasion and i'm not even joking like for real wanted to which i dug by the way yeah. i mean i couldn't engage him because you know it, you know i mean you didn't stuff. challenge me you'd be getting that double leg. <laughs> straight up <laughs> either way okay kids on the back so which brings me to our uh store mm-hmm. jocko has a store it's called jocko store mm-hmm. right pretty straightforward anyway there is there are warrior kid rash guards for when yeah. they join jujitsu mm-hmm. no gi part of it rash guards on there there's obviously worry kid shirts yeah if they're in the gi part of it that's cool you go to originmain.com and you yeah. get them you get them the warrior gi get yeah. some boom and also new edition for warrior kids patches oh. on there right now if you went literally right now you live yep live patches yeah Check. for your gi for your backpack mm-hmm. you know we're, we're obviously wherever you want to put yeah. it but yeah the little round one and a long kind of jiu-jitsu one made kind of for jiu-jitsu but you can put it wherever you want anyway yeah it's on jockostore.com also on jockostore.com is where you can get your shirts mm-hmm. disciplining for freedom that's one of the thing about shirts is everyone wears shirts yes. even if you don't want to wear one which yeah. i don't like wearing a shirt hell no but I you sometimes you gotta wear a shirt. You kind of gotta wear yeah. a shirt, bro. Everyone needs a shirt. Might as yeah. well be a, kind of a cool one. Might as well in represent. My <laughs> yeah, big time. <laughs> and so, truckers hats. Truckers hats I'm, on there. I'm completely stoked on my discipline equals freedom hat. Yes. Are the defcore hats out yet? The defcore hats are should be done. Are they live? I don't know. Okay. I got t- there was a. Th- there was a technical thing where, like, the logo and mm. get, you know, because hats have panels, a certain mm. amount of panels, and you know, the logo does it fit on this? This does it go on the seam? Yep. Or, or, or do we need a different panel hat yeah. now? So anyway, it's very technical. Well, but let's hope the Defcore hat is out soon. That's deep representing right there. What about the Defcore shirt? Is there a pure Defcore shirt? Black Ops. Uh, black on black. Yes. And then I was gonna. Call, <laughs> I was thinking of one called. Defcore declassified. It's just white on white. You know, whatever. <laughs> Black ops. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, check. um well, you know, yeah. You know, I'm gonna have to ask that we all kind of just kind of check back on that one. You know, okay. Maybe it's live, maybe it's not. Nonetheless, if you go there and you want to represent hardcore, that's where you can get your shirt. Or hoodie. New hoodie on the way, by the way. Oh. Yeah. Duty heavy, heavy duty. Heavy duty technically. <laughs> <laughs> this better be good, my Technically, brother. Technically, that's the thing. Anyway, hoodies on there. A lot of cool stuff on there. Right oh, on. and I did the research. Who, what, what's better? What do people literally? What do people like better? Flex fit hat or oh. trucker hat? Which one? Won? Even. It's even. Even Steven. Okay. Cool. Actually, there's like I think two more people, historically speaking, like the, the snapback. So uh, technically, you're right. Yes. But nonetheless, we got some rash guards on there as well. All right. Also, we got know. the podcast. Subscribe to it wherever. Uh, no, don't forget the Warrior Kid podcast. A lot of people don't know about that yet, so spread the word on the Warrior Kid podcast. Little questions from Uncle Jake, for Uncle Jake, and little stories from Uncle Jake about how he developed his sort of values in the world. Mm-hmm. That's the Warrior Kid podcast. The Warrior Kid soap from IrishOaksRanch.com. Young Aiden, the Warrior Kid, milking goats, making soap getting after it order some of that so you can stay clean also YouTube check out echoes legit enhanced videos which some people like some people like them most people I'd say like them. you don't get a lot of thumbs down on your videos yeah and what I like is when someone thumbs down your video there's there's a, multiple people in the comments that'll be like, who the hell called <laughs> down this? A communist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, good. So that's good. Well, that's and good, and yes. we're, we got some plans for the YouTube. We're going to step it up a little bit. Yeah. A little bit more, I should say, because you've stepped it up a little bit. Yeah. We're going to step it up a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I think videos just in general are like fun to watch. Yeah, it could be just speaking for myself. But, well, you know. I, I would tend to agree with you and also yeah. psychological warfare working on album number two psychological warfare We're aiming for a Christmas release If you have any suggestions hit me up on Twitter in the meantime You got the psychological warfare one album which can help you get through whatever little moments of weakness I wish I had it the other day for that cake got a hold of my brain <laughs> with ice cream 
Yeah. So watch well, out for that one. Well, it's good about that. You learned, it seemed like anyway, according to your post, mm-hmm. you, that you learned a little lesson. And you were open about it too. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. You can't be like hiding your failures and then acting like. No, because cause I'm human. Yeah, yeah. Anyone that thinks I'm not human, you're wrong. I'm all too human. Yeah. I get tapped out in jujitsu. I get mm-hmm. what, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like. Yeah. Hey. And you, and you pound huge pieces of cake with Every a once in a while, cream. cake with ice cream. Ugh. <laughs> so disappointed in myself. Anyway, stay on the Jack. path is what I'm saying. Um, also, if you're if you're incorporating kettlebell workouts in various ring workouts, I'll tell you where you can get them. Get them from on it on it.com slash Jocko. By the way, I incorporate rings every single day. Every single day. You're on the ring for abs and core, bro. It's good. Yeah. And I can't quite. I can almost do pull ups again oh, with nice. my bicep or whatever. But muscle bro, ups coming too. Muscle ups coming. Soon. Actually, you know that actually, my shoulders are getting back. Up to speed, because yeah. it w- went through a little down period. Then it got, then it got healed. Now that I tweaked it again, doing yeah. something stupid. You know what I did? Eat, yeah, eat ice cream. That's what no, you I didn't do that. I added massive numbers of weighted dips, super deep, and it and it messed up your shoulder. It messed up my shoulder. Oh, that was like that was like six months ago or something. I mean, it was a long time ago. Yeah. I've been dealing with it, but finally it's coming back around. Yeah, and shoulders pain in the ass, man. Yeah, you got to ma- do the maintenance, man. You got to do the maintenance, and I don't do enough of it. I need to do more of it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, on it, go there. That's the you can get some cool workout stuff, and actually good travel workout stuff too. Like those. Well, you always said this, I know, but you know, I'm, I'm slowly coming to the realization yeah. that you tr- when you travel with rings, that opens up your oh, whole travel that's a game workout. changer. Yeah, game changer. Huge time. Check. You know, hey, if you're, you're working out too, and you're working on that deadlift. Mm-hmm. One thing you can do is if you probably if you're stuck at like a four thousand pound deadlift plateau, no, we can't accept that. Gosh. Get Jocko White tea, and it comes with a guarantee. I don't know what kind of guarantee that so you can deadlift eight thousand pounds immediately. Probably yeah. take you like four sips. Yeah. If you can't dift, if you can't deadlift eight thousand pounds after drinking Jocko White tea, either the ones in a can or the ones in a tea bag. Uh, that you can get them on Amazon. If you can't, if your deadlift isn't eight thousand pounds after that, mm-hmm. just drink more, and you'll get there. <laughs> just keep that's, drinking. That's the thing. So, yeah. Also, got some Makes books. Sense. Obviously, the Way of the Warrior Kid books. That the first one is Way of the Warrior Kid. The second one is Mark's Mission, which is the best book. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it. it's a bold statement. In fact, I was debating whether or not to actually say it out loud. If it, that's the best book in the world, straight up. Mark's, Mark's Mission. Mission, the second one. <laughs> You okay? So I'm reading it to my. We just finished it uh, right. a week ago. Oh, is this your first time finishing it? Finishing it, yes. Oh, okay, a week ago. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, well, because we jumped around to another book, it's a long story, but nonetheless, yeah. So finished it, right? So, y- you know why though? Now that I'm searching my feelings, it it starts to address a little bit more sophisticated issues yeah. that you can go through you know even though when you think you got it figured out mm-hmm. you know you're taking jujitsu now and you can do pull-ups and all this stuff or what do you can so to address those a little bit more advanced issues sophisticated but like the depth of which like these issues go mm-hmm. and the way you got to solve them are like the way it's simplified and broken down to kids it, or to whoever's reading it because yeah. quite frankly it's broken down to me in this case um is like it's pretty We'll just say it's pretty interesting, but at the same time, you it, you glorify things like hard work, right? In a yeah. way that it actually makes the kid want to work hard. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, getting a job, like go mow lawns and pull weeds. By the way, yeah. which if we all, you know we all know that when you did that as a kid, you're like, no, bro, no. we don't want to do that. Pulling weeds is, is a form of punishment. In yeah, my, in my house. Yeah, exactly right. At this time, after reading that part, um, my daughter. By the way, she wants to pull weeds. Yeah, she's she's salty because she doesn't have a job mowing lawn, lawns and pulling weeds. Yeah, and he makes like he's like he's like forty dollars. I made forty dollars, right? Like exclamation point. And she's like, oh my gosh, you made forty dollars. I want to make forty dollars. You know, just the way it's laid out, how simple. But you know, I'm re- I'm getting into it, and it's I see it affecting it, um, my daughter. So then it moves on to the jujitsu part, and this yeah. part affected me. You know, it's oh. like, you know, well, let's face it. Like, that's why when you get nervous in jujitsu with tournaments or whatever, mm-hmm. like there was, a, I remember when I was competing and strangely, I was competing a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Like every, like maybe two, three weeks, there was a tournament back then. It wasn't as often as now, but, mm-hmm. um, and I would be competing, but every single one 
seems like we're driving there and if like my wife who's i think my girlfriend at the time um and my brother whoever's driving was if they're talking about other stuff i'm like getting mad at them because i'm like don't you realize i have a tournament it's like that idea you know and i'm like i don't behave that way but that's what's going on in my mind and a and a tangible small but tangible part of my mind is like hoping that like the gym burnt down when we got there Uh. like i just don't want it you know it's like that it's weird but then the way like you lay out because Mark didn't want to compete in a tournament, mm-hmm. right? And the way you lay out and you really, it's a call out is what it is. It's like you're calling out. You're like, I'm afraid, but you know, it's like you're not afraid of jujitsu. You do jujitsu every day. Mm-hmm. Full speed, by the way. Mm-hmm. And you're not afraid of jujitsu. You're afraid of losing. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Losing is okay. Yes. It's like, it really hit me. Anyway, it, and then from there to me, from then on, it was like, and how it culminated is good, man. It's, it's straight up the best book in the world. I'll give it to you. Don't no, want don't. to, but never mind Cormac McCarthy. Never mind about <laughs> face. <laughs> Way the warrior kid. Hey, uh, also got the discipline equals freedom field manual. How to get after it for adults. And actually, a lot of kids read this book. That's where they graduate. They graduate from warrior kid. I talked to a lot of parents, and they're like, "Oh yeah, once you know, now he's fourteen. He he just read discipline equals freedom field manual." So 14. that's the that's the graduate. Can you imagine if you had that book when you were fourteen? Game changer. Yeah, game changer. Right. Any one of the, I'll tell well, you right yeah, now I mean, the Warrior Kid one. That that one. Yeah, that one is. Yeah, no. The feedback that I get from, but the it's the same kind of feedback I get from the kids from the field manual yeah, of yeah. people that are like, okay. hey, I read this every day. I yeah. read two pages of this every yeah. day. So yeah. I can keep my mind right. Yeah, that and that's how that works. Like that's the one you refer back to every day, yeah. or you know, every do- other day or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Just how it's the guy hit me up on Twitter. Remember that story I told about being at Yosemite? Yeah, and the dude was in the river. Sure. And he's like, I was like, oh, he recognized me, and I was getting all fired up with him. And he was like, I'm here to get my mind right. <laughs> and I was like, Yeah. <laughs> yep. Anyways, that's how. the guy's friend hit me up on Twitter, mm-hmm. and that dude's name is Meth. That's his yeah. name. His name is Meth. Meth. Not, meth. M E T H. Oh, like, like the drug. Straight up. Yeah, got it. But cool. he was not a meth user. <laughs> that just happens to be his name. Gotcha. Uh, okay, then also Extreme Ownership. Obviously, that's the first book I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. And we followed that book up very recently with a book called The Dichotomy of Leadership. There's a million interviews on it. We talked about it on this podcast. That book is going to really help leaders finish out strong. And then, of course, coming out in November, order it now, Mikey and the Dragons. Echelon Front, that's my leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. It's me, it's Leif Babin, it's JP Dinell, it's Dave Burke, it's Flynn Cochran, Mike Sorelli, and Mike Bahama. Don't call a speaking agency. If you want us to come and talk to you or your company, email us, info at echelonfront.com. Muster 006 in San Francisco, October 17th and 18th. Ah, sold out. Sorry. Last thing, we've got EF Overwatch, which is connecting spec ops veterans and companies that need experienced leaders ready to go. If you're a company that needs leadership, leadership that understands and operates within the principles of extreme ownership, go to efoverwatch.com. If you're a spec ops vet, if you're a former combat aviator, go to efoverwatch.com and we will connect you two together. And if anyone out there has questions or answers for us, you can find us out there on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram and on that Facebook. <laughs> Echo is at Echo Charles and I am at Jocko Willink. And thanks to all military, police, law enforcement, correctional officers, firefighters, border patrol, paramedics, all first responders. It was great meeting so many of you at roll call. It was, it was just awesome to meet you all. And at a bunch of the other events I've done in the past couple of weeks, the book signings and whatnot. Knowing that you all are out there holding the line and watching our six and protecting our flanks is awesome. And I'll tell you what, I do not take it for granted. I do not take it for granted that you're there. And no one should. So thanks to you all for doing what you do and for everyone else that is out there. Remember the way. 
and remember that you can use it everywhere in everything that you do so find the enemy's weak points attack the enemy violently be bold and decisive seize and hold the initiative keep the enemy under constant pressure and off balance and be fully prepared to accomplish the mission regardless of the conditions under which the war begins and of course you do all those things by stepping out into the fray and getting after it and until next time this is echo and Jocko.